All right, it is 6.30. Let's call this workshop to order. Dan, would you uh, take a note of attendance, please? Will do. All right, ask everyone to rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a couple people signing up for open forum. Thanks, Donovan. Bruce Anderson. I request that I wait till point number five. Sure, sure that's fine. Here. All right. And uh, Mark? Did you want to wait as well, or do you want Same to speak request. now? Yes. Sounds good. We'll call you up then. Thank you. So, Donovan, do you want to take us through the uh, comprehensive right of way ordinance? Sure. So this is a reelect is a, a draft um, workshop discussion on the comprehensive right of way ordinance. Um, this is something that was a subject of a previous city council workshop. Um, I'd like to go through some of the, kind of keep it at a, a kind of 50, 20,000 foot level, some of the general terms, and really explain how, in many ways, this kind of formalizes what currently is, is city, uh, city policy. And... So you can actually... Oh, wait a minute, it doesn't work now. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, basically allows the city to do things they've been doing for years, but um, actually didn't really have the legal authority to do, um, such as trimming um, vegetation within the right of way. Um, what, what you have, what you have before you in your packets, um, is basically um, it's based on the um, on League of Minnesota's. League of Minnesota City's uh, model policy. Um, this process began in December, actually, with kind of assembling what um, Forest Lake needs. And this also is linked to the small wireless facilities ordinance and the need to comply with state statutes. Um, as I said, this aligns city code with current staff practices. Um, it consolidates and simplifies city code. Um, it describes what work can be done in the public right of way and outlines the city permit process. And then um, it, lists this, it addressed a series of issues um, identified by Public Works, engineering, and zoning. And so, um, and I'll get into that more in a little bit. So, as I said, it consolidates the standards because currently, right away, um, or language is within all these different chapters. Um, and this will actually repeal Chapter 98 and replace it with this Compre Comprehensive Right of Ordinance text. And uh, it's also, again, relating to, you know, the new, the new facilities that we're seeing in our right of, rights of way provides a permitting process. And, and uh, also importantly, it recovers the city costs um, for these, uh, this kind of, for the permitting uh, and, and the work the city does currently. Um, and why is it needed? Um, it provides a place for the co-location agreement um, which is, this is basically a lease agreement if, if uh, a um, carrier, telecom carrier wants to use a, um, a city pole as their wireless support structure. Um, it, it kind of spells out um, the le lesser and the leasee's responsibilities. Um, clarifies public works, rights to trim vegetation the right of way. And for the first time really spells out um, what private improvements are allowed in the right of way, such as culverts, driveways, mailboxes, and of course, the small wireless facilities that will be seen. And also, um, this is something that Public Works deals with with some regularity. Um, that they claim that um, you know the, the, these driveway culverts are public, and we have to inform them that they are private. And up to this point, there's been no language to actually clarify that. And so this will actually provide something to you know for Public Works to point to. To say that yes, it is private 
private improvement and private responsibility for maintenance. And uh, <coughs> also, um, for the first time, creates uh, a, a, dis a type of permit, a disturbance permit, which actually is not in your text. We need to finalize the um, language for that. But about 100 times a year, Mid-Continent calls and wants to do a, a service line installation, you know, from their, their pedestal to a uh, house. It's about a six inch trench they dig and it's, you know, quickly filled in after they put their, their cable in. Um, but that involves about two hours of city staff time every time that they pull one of these, these permits. And so what this right-of-way ordinance will do will actually allow the city to recover that, um, that you know, be able to be compensated for that staff time um, also, it could create an incentive for Mid-Continent to put their um, either uh, cables in during when the trench is open during original uh, subdivision um, development when uh, other public infrastructure is is uh, installed. And then also, something that's it was a zoning concern is that with this, um, we can now hold uh, residents responsible for for the lawn maintenance. Uh, we're currently, if it's city property. Um, we couldn't have said, you know, because there's always a, that's, that, um, that area between the, uh, the right-of-way and the curb or, or even, you know, in the, in the boulevard. Um, and, you know, almost universally, people do mow that area. But, you know, the city has no authority if I um, was going to cite them for long grass. Um, I couldn't do that because it's not officially their property. It's the, the okay. city's. Um, so this just allows that, just in that extreme case where someone um, would want to, uh, you know, not, not figure out where the right-of-way line is and then not mow beyond it. Also, um, we received, uh, the, the city attorney has determined that uh, if the city is not maintained the right-of-way, if it's a platted street but it's unimproved, that uh, the city can't, um, the, the zoning staff cannot um, force uh, residents to move things from there. Um, and we do receive some complaints where trailers, mostly it's in the shoreland areas, um, trailers are stored, you know, pri private possessions are stored on public property, um, and this all actually allows the city to um, have them move it in those cases where we do receive complaints. Um, and, it, and finally, as I mentioned, um, this, would, this does can involve recovery of costs. So can I interrupt real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, you said we do or do not have the authority to enforce them to maintain the right of way in an unimproved road surface. I missed right that. now, we do not have the right to have them move a, say, a, a boat trailer. Um, this, this is that's the most common instance. Um, but we, uh, you know, that's. Are, are, you, are you referring to the, the the grass cutting? As far as the grass cutting, are they? Re is this going to require them to mow the grass on a dirt road? On a dirt up, road? Up to an unimproved surface? You, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I mean, in, in cases where there's a lot of the gravel roads, the city does choose to you know, mow the ditches. Yep. And the way it's langu the language is that the you know, city may, may maintain that grass, may maintain these, um, may maintain that right away. But, but we're, we're not going to hold them responsible to maintain it? Um, not in those cases. I mean, it, actually, the way the code works, um, in, on, on these large, in, uh, in the more rural areas where the zoning in the large, there are large parcels, the, uh, the long grass, like the nuisance grass you know, ordinance doesn't apply. So how, how are we going to differentiate that? I guess I'm just thinking you get in the rural area, you got a five acre lot, you know, dirt road or um, what have you. Are we going to make them mow the ditch all five acres there? Um, no. I mean, it, it, we have the ability to if it's in, um, you know, if it's in an area that, you know, is zoned, you know, you know more, you know, densely, densely residential zoning. So is there language that spells out which areas we're going to require that, or are we just using an unimproved surface as that uh, rule of thumb? No, it, it, well, it's actually within the, um, the nuisance ordinance, which specifies, you know, where the, the long grass rules apply which they don't apply for properties. I think it's more than five acres or greater in size and in the agricultural and rural residential areas. Go ahead. Donovan, can you back up a slide here? 
Yeah, then that's exactly what he's talking about. It's hold residents responsible for lawn maintenance in adjacent ROW. Correct. So it's not the right of way that they have to maintain. It's just their land. Is that well, correct? Yeah, I mean, in many cases, they... Um, it is their land. The right of way overlays their land. I know, but you can't hold them responsible. The way I read that, you can't hold them responsible for the right of way. You can only just the adjacent land. Is that correct? Um, I'll pull up the exact language. The right of way is what's adjacent to the property. That's the way I'm reading it. I don't know if anybody can clarify it, but you're not supposed to mow the ditches in right. the rural areas. That's why I'm asking. hunting and things, right? I mean, it's... Well, I always thought you can't, like where the drainage ditch is to the road, that that's not the land, the homeowner's responsibility. In which case, we were drawing the line in. Well... Curb and gutter, or... That's what's not spelled out here. I like the telephone pole back type. Well, thing. I mean, you could usually most, if you go down 97, you got probably 20 feet before you hit the ditch, and then up to the property that goes to the landowner, right? Mm -hmm. So what does he cut? The along the road and his, and leave the ditch alone, or, you know what I'm saying? And how would you enforce something like that? I'll show you where, um, where it's not, um, <clears throat> so this is the noxious weeds and grass part of the zoning code. And within the actual the, the comprehensive right way text you have, um, it says, notwithstanding the exceptions noted in city code sections 96, 025, C and D. We're here C and D on your screen that um, in all zoning districts except the cons conservancy, agricultural and rural residential and except with other exceptions, um, undeveloped land with an area of five or more acres, public open spaces, C roads right away without curbing gutter, um, the, uh, you know, they're allowed to gr allow grass to grow to a height of eight or more inches. So. Curb and gutter is the rule of thumb then? Well, also that within the zoning district and um, parcel size. And there, I mean, there's a whole, a whole list of places where you, know, with wetland, buffer areas, bluff lands, designated wetlands. And so this is in the more, um, you know, basically the, the, the areas where you have, you know, often have sidewalks, where you have curbs. Um, And I think one thing to keep in mind too when it comes to long grass complaints is that typically we respond back to complaints from neighbors. So if a neighbor comes in and say, you know, like a fully developed residential neighborhood, we'll go out and investigate that claim. If it's in a rural area, we'll look through and then compare the right of way ordinance to what the exact, you know, compare it back to code on a case by case basis. And, you know, we don't have people out there with measuring sticks on every single property looking to see if they're, you know, over the eight inches or not. So we're, it's a complaint based system. So in essence, it's basically in those situations where like say in, you know, the developed, the fully developed, like a more traditional city lot, we have the ability then to basically make sure that that homeowner takes care of that right away um, piece of their property and mow that and maintain that as well. I just want to make sure we're inadvertently creating a... Yeah, no. no. It's, yeah. It's, it's and this really, I mean, it's, it's, I'm probably about the only, and now you guys, the only people in the, in the city who knew that there was this hole in, in our city code. I mean, that's how I, people, when they're, if they don't mow their lawn, they, they don't mow all of it, you know? So there's, there's no distinction between right of way mowing or not. Um, and that's where, and so when we do get the long grass complaints, that's, you know, you know, this doesn't come up at all, but officially, you know, we, we couldn't have, you know, we couldn't say to them, you have to cut within that without, you know, this kind of clause that's within the text here. Okay. That answers my question, yeah. And then, so finally, um, there is a, uh, as I mentioned, um, there's a, a, fee, a fee schedule amendment that would allow the city to recover the costs. Um, that go everything from an excavation permit where there is a, you know, city in infrastructure, a roads being torn up, curbs impacted sidewalks, um, to uh, the Meyer excavation permit or the disturbance permit, um, obstruction permit if they 
were obstructing the right of way, or else if they you know sought permission to store their um, their trailer within a city right of way, um, unapproved right of way, and then small wireless facility permit. And so that's you know that that'll you know I can imagine this could be part of the the examination of the other parts of the fee schedule. So that's kind of the um, the overall. Uh, you know, outline of this. Uh, I'd be happy to take, take any questions from the council. A um, couple things jumped out at me. Um, first was culvert replacement, and we have so many, so much wetland, so many problems with drainage as it is. I would like something, and Ryan could probably word it a lot better or find if there's a place. But you know, if people are going to replace a culvert. They need to find out what elevation they can bring it down to because they typically flop it on top of the ground and cover it up, but that's creating a dam. And mm -hmm. every time they replace it, you know, it, it causes more wetland issues ahead of it than there was before. So I would like something in the ordinance saying that, you know, the culverts have to be brought down to ABC, I don't know, whatever. There's got to be a, you know, that elevation that the wetland rice creek or somebody determined at at one time or not that you know at least they bring it to that lowest, if not lower than that lowest point in the ditch at least well but that's the problem because if you put the culvert at the lowest point of the ditch a lake. you know everything builds up again in the ditch because there's only you know a little bit at the bottom of the culvert so your water keeps backing up again you know normally the culverts kind of get silted in all around them over years. So I'd like, whenever they're replacing the culvert, to be able to excavate that down to, you know, what we could consider like an original grade or, you know, subcut that three or four inches so that that culvert can handle the capacity that's going through there without having all that back up. So that was one thing I noticed. Um, I guess the other thing is, and I, I'd like some clarification on, you know how other cities do it but you know when you're talking it takes a couple hours every time for one of these permits a city work but you know whether it's mid-continent or AT&T or you know any of these companies get you know get whoever's putting in you know multiple installations separate installations throughout the year can't they just pay us one fee you know three hundred dollars five hundred bucks and then just you know call and say you know we're putting in a, a a service line at you know 12 North Lake Street or something, but I don't know how much staff time it really takes to do that because I don't understand how much paperwork it takes here for them to put a cable from the street into a house. So if there's any way we can make it easier for the contractors that we have here that are that are putting things in and just allow them to buy a yearly permit. And if that takes, you know, maybe posting a bond instead of, you know, having to put a surety down for each one of these, a yearly bond or, mm -hmm. or a, a certificate of insurance. But if there's a way we can simplify, <laughs> reduce the amount of staff time it takes for each one of these to zero, um, that could cut out a lot of time and make it a lot more convenient for the installers. So I would like to see something like that as well. And uh, the other thing that kind of jumped out on me was why would we require people to move trailers or other things? Not, I mean, it's still their property, even though we have a right-of-way there. But if it's something mobile, but it's their property. I mean, why would we require them to move that? Or maybe the next-door neighbor doesn't have that right-of-way issue and parks a trailer someplace. So I'd like you to explain that a little bit there. Sure. Um, in these cases, I mean, these are sided roads. I'm thinking of one on Clear Lake, for instance, where all uh, winter they stored their boat. And neighbors have have, um, have complained, and it seems, and I've talked to the, this, the adjacent neighbor before, and they've kind of taken a sense of ownership of it, and they do mow it. I'm, you know, I'm glad for that. Um, but it's, you know, it's not actually a part of their property. This was part of the subdivision. And, and that's what I mean. It's, it's the platted roads. It's not where, in this many cases, of course, they're easements, and and mm -hmm. we don't get a lot of these complaints, and mostly they are in Sherland areas. And there's, you know, so many platted roads throughout well, the city. Well, if it's not their property, but it's actually city-owned property, then yeah. that's fine. I can understand that. So, 
that'd be fine. Um, also, I just want to mention, um, we did get uh, some feedback from Verizon, and a couple of representatives from Verizon are here. Um, they had some, a, uh, they marked up the, uh, the text with a few comments related to um, the, some of the specific language, and I had a conversation with Bridget, um, the city attorney, prior to this, and some of the um, comments they, you know, the, um, Bridget feels is reasonable. Some she'd like to have the city, you know, keep retain the language that proposed, um, and so I imagine that you know Verizon will have some feedback, for, you know, on these. You know, it's very m much, you know, in detailed as far as um, some of the language. All right. I think a moment of clarification on the the like the right of way permits for like cable installations. Um, I think if you look at the language at the end, it's on the last slide. I think we call them. Can you pull up the last slide, Donovan? Uh, there was a little bit of like language changes how these kind of gone through. I think we're calling them minor, just minor excavation permits. So like for the reason why we came up with those ones is for those in those situations where you're not doing a big trench in a right away, but you're just like you're putting in from the pedestal, you're having to go down 400 feet for cable install. We want to make sure that that's done, you know, that we're monitoring that. Dave does go actually go out there. He files a permit. He gives them a permit that allows them to do the work, um, does an inspection to make sure it was done, and then keeps track of all that. So he does put, as he's kind of go through, he does, he's keeping track of what the, private, the cable hookups are. Um, that minor uh, excavation permit, too, also would potentially incentivize when we do the open trenches and developments to kind of get their utilities in early so we're not kind of having to kind of go down this road, but we did try to figure out kind of a way to, instead of every time they come in for a, you know, a um, cable hookup to make them go through an excavation permit, which requires the bond, which requires the escrow on the, the bigger $300 permit fee, we figured if we could simplify that down so we could kind of at least get these in a little bit quicker and not be so, you know, kind of raise the bar so high for compliance, but yet make it where, you know, every time they do that, we are, there's some incentive for them to let us know so we can at least track them. So if a, a homeowner comes through, cuts a line, we at least kind of know where those lines are going in the right of way. Because again, you know, it's a private utility and a public right of way. We want to kind of make sure that we maintain or know what's in those in those rights of way. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, and just to add on that, a lot of time we have to guide their alignment for them. Otherwise, it'll be in conflict with each, either future projects or projects that we're, we know of or planned development projects. And or sometimes when they sub the work out from, you know, the the main company, you know, a subcontractor comes in, his goal of the day is to blitz that line as fast as they can, and uh, we've now starting to see it in some of our northwest construction sites, instructionally drill right through your storm sewer. So that's what we're dealing with, and why, the, why you have the permitting for that. As regards to, like, just the cable connection to a house, I've never seen that, so I don't know how you guys internally deal with that one. I mean, we're talking about crossing roads or long stretches of roadway within the public infrastructure uh, to connect the existing points. So there's a lot that goes on with that and to protect and plan for future projects as well. Uh, because if they're in our way, then we have those delays in the future too, knowing if we have a street project in a particular area or a site redevelopment project in the works too, so. No, I'm assuming if, uh, if it's a cable hookup, um, above ground from the poles that there's no permit required then? So all the stuff goes into public works. If it's project related, that comes to me. Mm -hmm. Or every once in a while, if you know public works doesn't know about something, we'll then have a conversation, just a conversation. Yes, there's this that needs to be planned for. Here's kind of what that involves and where they need to plan to be. Or if it's just kind of all on its own, uh, public works handles those all themselves. Okay. Is a hundred dollars adequate for the amount of time we? I don't know how you have that tied without through. Dave did look at that. I, that was one of the questions I asked Dave, and we were kind of going through on the fees. I said, "Are the fees in line with actual staff time? Are they kind of shots in the dark?" And he said, "No." When he, those are pretty accurate to what he asked to put in for time. You know, in terms of. Administering them, checking up, and verifying and filing paperwork and stuff. So those actually do recover costs that he spends to get the permits issued and administered. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Well, or? it's not like a plan review or anything. You're just getting a permit. 
<clears throat> right. So it, same thing probably takes, what, 20 minutes or something like that? Or? There's a little bit more of that. He'll do a couple of site inspections to make sure that it was actually done, you know, and just do some follow-up work and stuff. So when he, when he figures out his total time, I think he was saying per, you know, some of the bigger ones, you know, three, four, five hours. You know, I mean, again, it depends on the complexity, but he did average these out to make sure that he wasn't, they weren't, you know, these aren't basically money makers. They're just recouping the city costs on that. And it's one of those things where as we kind of get these things in line, if we're seeing, you know, administration costs go down, we could look at, you know, potentially reducing that fee, but he feels pretty confident those fees will recoup, you know, the staff time required to administer them. I'm curious about the obstruction permit, what's going to constitute pulling a permit. Uh, houses getting built, they're going to have trusses or other building materials dropped off. They'll be blocking the road for a period of time. Um, somebody's getting their sidewalk replaced, you know, they might have offloading a skid loader, coned off tree removal, things like that. Um, are these going to need an obstruction permit? Um, yeah, certainly the, um, when the right of way is for some reason, this is kind of the, I guess it's the city version of what you know, MnDOT requires. Um, you know, they, they're, they're required to submit some sort of traffic control plan. Um, and if it's, and I think it's written, um, there is, I think it's more than, if it's more than six hours or something like that, um, you know, it's defined what, it, what is temporary because if, you're, if it's just a matter of a truck being parked in a place where there's not a parking spot, I mean, that's not a, that's not a need, you know. Um, you know, they're, they're probably, it probably wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't require it, but basically the obstruction is defined as to place any tangible object upon a right-of-way so as to hinder free and open passage over that in any part of the right-of-way. Um, I read through that. I didn't see any, you know, I'm, I'm sure the code's there somewhere, but uh, I didn't see, like you said, the temporary. What constitutes temporary? Uh, is that a partial lane obstruction, a full lane, or full load, full road closure? Those kinds of things are what I'm... And so would you like to get more clarification there? Correct. Sure. Yeah, I, I have to admit that part of this is, um, I don't know, somehow I got drafted. I, you know, I think everyone else took a step back because I often don't work with the right-of-ways. Um, and unfortunately, Dave had a co schedule conflict tonight because um, he could probably, you know, you know, quote this chapter and verse in a way that, you know, it, it can give you real practical examples of, um, you know, when, you know, when obstruction, you know, does occur. And uh, as long as we're on this page, a small wireless facility permit, that's a one-time charge or is that a yearly fee? That's a charge if, let's say if, um, in any, any way that the, the, uh, the carrier wasn't uh, digging up the right of way, you know, wasn't, um, uh, you know, digging up the right of way, you know, wasn't, wasn't excavating, but was putting something. So it might be, um, you know, if they, it's just to know that where those small wireless facilities are within the, the right of way. Okay. Um, it might be in addition to other ones too, but, you know, it might be examples where they, maybe they, lay lots of line and then come back later to actually install the actual facilities themselves. Okay. Now are handholes going to be considered with the wireless facility? You know, the, the vaults, they'd make the connections out in the ditch. Small wireless facilities are going to have a pole structure along with that. I mean, a lot of times you have your handhole connections. Are we doing anything with those? I'm not sure you mean by handhold. It's like a small composite manhole. It's their, they'll lay their fiber up to make connections, splices, running. You know, when they, when they put the line in, they can only go so far with the machine or the equipment. And they stop and they put an access point. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, very in size from two to four feet roughly. Okay. Are we monitoring those locations or charging anything or requiring a permit for those? Well, if it involves the excavation, certainly. You know, it sounds like it, it would be for that. You know, part of this is to just be able to map out where everything is so that, you know, when the next permit comes in, we know, you know, where things are getting too congested, you know, propose alternative routes or just make sure that one, you know, one telecom isn't um, interrupting some, someone else's service. All right. Any other comments, questions? You got what you need to work with then, Donovan? Yes, sir. All right.
So just so for clarification, we'll take this back and kind of redraft with the comments and we'll bring it up probably the first meeting in August for consideration because we have to finalize the text and do a 10-day notification since it's an ordinance. So it'll be the first meeting in August. I'll see this again. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. The only question I have, is this initiated by us or is this something that's going to be mandated to us? Like the, the draft, the start of this? This, I think it's coming down from the, the state. I believe Dave, it was kind of a group effort to kind of look at, we should probably get one of these on the books just to make sure that we're putting all of these ordinances in one spot because it's all kind of piecemeal throughout the code and some of the stuff. We just would want to make sure that you have an ordinance behind for, you know, if you're out there doing work and something gets damaged in the right of way, you want something behind it, you know, so that's kind of, it's probably more staff driven than was in, than state mandate driven. But Brian could probably clarify too. So it really started evolving with the changes in legislation with small cells. Comprehensively around the metro, a lot of communities looked at each other and says, wow, we got kind of our stuff all over the board in different spots. Let's take this opportunity to do a comprehensive right away. Your neighbor uh, to the East Scania did it, I know, and I've seen and read tons of other ones through the metro too. So kind of took it as an opportunity to develop one, one spot with all your information and update stuff as some of it was probably drafted 30 years ago, you know? So that's kind of how we evolved and why we're here. And to get it all on paper because there's some things that were being implemented just by pra past practice but not written down anywhere. So this now just gives you guys that ability to show somebody who wants to see that clarification physically. All right. Will you allow me to address the council briefly? Welcome. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Catherine Pasker, and I'm here with my colleague James Littlejohn from Mossam Barnett, that's 150 South 5th Street, Minneapolis. Just want to briefly touch on this ordinance that you're considering at this workshop. Um, staff has done a really great job in drafting an ordinance that, like, the title is very comprehensive and addresses a lot of different uses of the rights of way. I want to just briefly touch on the small wireless facilities portion and the suggestions that we have provided to staff um, in the form of a red line, just very, um, really to touch on those specific changes that we think are um, called for by current industry practice, which is um, a certificate of insurance rather than a copy of the whole entire policy like the uh, ordinance calls for right now. That's pretty standard. Talking about reducing staff time from these really, really, really comprehensive insurance policies that are really only available for inspection instead of just kind of the one form uh, certificate of insurance that we routinely to pro provide to cities um, to reflect that we have the insurance necessary to protect um, city assets while uh, telecommunications companies like Verizon are working in, within city right of way. Uh, the second piece is the city like is indicated in Mr. Hart's presentation, was going to charge a small wireless facility permit fee. Um, we just want that broken down a little bit. Uh, one piece of that is any construction or engineering costs um, that the city incurs for some reason. Um, we think those costs should be uh, recouped from the cost causer and not for anyone that happens to be applying for a small wireless facility permit in the city. Um, and finally, a piece of the kind of if someone breaches the permit, what can the city do about that to get that party into compliance? Right now, the ordinance is drafted so that if a party didn't uh, cure a breach that the city notified them of, they wouldn't be able to obtain another permit from the city for a year. Um, we don't think that is allowed by uh, current uh, Public Utilities Commission rules. We think that the city does have sufficient tools um, including, of course, automatic revocation of that permit that is in breach um, and requiring before that party is able to get another permit from the city to uh, repay the city for any costs that the city incurs. And I guess just one other suggestion that we didn't include in our red line, but from Mr. Hart's presentation, we're just wondering, and hopefully in your next meeting, um, it'll be clarified how the city intends to recoup it's rent and maintenance that would be paid to the city for any small wireless facilities that are installed on city assets. That's not addressed in the um, 
ordinance that's drafted right now. I don't know if uh, the city's intention is to put that in a permit fee or in the co-location agreement that's uh, contemplated by the ordinance right now. We haven't seen a final draft of that. Um, but just, I guess, something to keep in mind, something to look for. Um, thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I do have a question. Uh, you just said who's responsible, I believe, for the maintenance of small wireless. Would that be your equipment, right? Would that not? So the, so this, the Minnesota Small Wireless Facility statute lays, lays out certain fees that telecommunications right-of-way users like Verizon Wireless will pay to the city. One is 100, up to $150 per year for rent for the space on the pole occupied, and then uh, $25 per year to the city for the maintenance of the pole. Of course, Verizon Wireless will be responsible for the maintenance of its own equipment. So it's when it comes to painting a pole, who paints it? Uh, that would be uh, the city in their ownership of the pole. For 25 bucks? That's the pole that we own, right? Oh, it's That's the pole they own, right? No, he's no, using no. the pole that What's we pole? own. Our pole? Mm -hmm. right. Correct. Our pole. Okay. If I, if I could insert something here, um, there is a, a draft co-location agreement that, were, that we didn't pull before, you know, council at this time, just to kind of, you know, again, just kind of take off more digestible chunks of this, this project. Um, and it does, uh, you know, mention you know, maintenance of the poles and, you know, as far as the facility goes, the, you know, the, the uh, telecom is responsible for any sorts of damage done to the pole or maintenance of, you know, their facilities. If the city wanted to paint the poles, you know, there's a specified time where the city would notify the telecom to pull their facilities off for that, you know, temporarily while the city did, did that sort of maintenance. Um, and so this, this will come, you know, we expect this will come, you know, the co-location agreement will come before council and we can, you know, have more discussion on this. Okay. All right. Uh, one more. I'm hoping this is something that's going to be available to submit online. Is that plan for the city to do? Yeah, we'll work on, once we get, if, if approved, we'll work on the administration of it. But yeah, we can definitely get it teed up for an online submission. Okay. Is that for all permitting or just... Well, we run about this right away for sure. I mean, is a lot of our the, permits are actually are online. I mean, they're electronically available for electronic fill out and submission through email. So we're migrating towards that right now. But yeah, this would be one that we could easily get teed up for that as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, public access, and we have a couple of <coughs> open forums that were deferred to this point. So, uh, did you want to make? Uh, any statement uh, beforehand, Bruce? Or? We're, we're done. We can let Donovan present and then we can open it up to discussion if you'd like. Okay. Um, so it's, it's pretty common that the, the city does get um, requests um, to vacate, you know, a public access point. Um, there are approximately 34 on Forest Lake and you know, three on Clear Lake, no on Lake Kuwatin. And staff has so far developed a kind of a draft map of where these are. Um, so you can kind of see before you, this kind of gives you an idea of the locations and, and uh, you know, this is not complete, um, but it, and it doesn't, it, you know, the, it does include the DNR launches or maybe it, like Lakefront Memorial Park, um, it is there. It is a kind of a both city and state um, access point, but the uh, but these these requests to uh, vacate do use up a, a, a good bit of um, city staff time, and so staff would like to get some direction on, you know, are any of these, you know, candidates for vacation, um, you know, is so that we don't spend a lot of time, you know, in because basically there is a you know a, a vacation petition. That residents or can um, basically petition city council to vacate them, and state statute allows these uh, public areas to be vacated. If there's no more public use to them. Um, commonly, the, uh, the most of the conversations I have with Ryan re regarding these are where um, he still sees a, pu a public need for these, um, and I'll, I kind of show you some, some examples where. Is on North Shore Trail on on, on a, you know Third Lake, 
where essentially this was platted. So this was, you know, dating back maybe the 1920s, you know, when the original subdivision occurred, they provide these road extensions. Um, and uh, if this, and right now they're currently used by, um, you know, people coming to watch sunset, you know, bring, you know, non-motorized um, boats, launch them from there, um, you know, watch a sunset maybe, and, or a sunrise. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, if, the, if the city were to actually um, expand North Shore Trail, basically increase the impervious surface, you know, watershed rules would requ require that they, you know, treat the stormwater. And the city would need a place to, to do the stormwater management facilities. And the city would either, you know, you know the idea is that the city would use one of, you know, these, you know, right, you know, maintain still you know, public access, but use this land for those facilities because it's either use the, this land the city already owns or purchase more land. Um, there are many of these that fall into that category. And just recently I did get a request, um, for, you know, someone regarding could, could, it, could one of these be, at, um, be vacated. Um, and of course, you know, the often, you know, residents will ask too, you know, what about the maintenance of these? Because um, they'll feel frustrated that the, you know, that there's public access, people are coming down, but the city, in many cases, I mean, they're not mowing the lawn. They're not, um, uh, in, in, you know, uh, in some cases, not maintain the trees. Um, and so there's, that's kind of part of the discussion as well, I believe. But um, we, uh, staff would like to get some more conversation around um, these access points. I mean, are there ones that the city should consider vacating? And I also like to um, uh, allow Ryan to speak some, because again, this is something I think he, he understands a lot better than I do. Uh, do, you think, do you have anything to add, Ryan? Uh, I w you know, obviously this is an ongoing conversation yearly all over the community. Uh, some of them have existing infrastructure in them, some don't, some are just you know, natural runoff of a road in an area or, or actually have underground piping or other uh, facilities such as hydrants and or uh, lift stations. So one thing that we really pushed very hardly, you know, in the last year when the rural revisions were going on with Comfort Lake Forest Lake was basically to adopt Rice Creek's rules, right? Because we had the lineal exception there that you could come in and reconstruct a road as long as you didn't add impervious area, uh, you wouldn't have to treat that the road then, right? So in, in Rice Creek, even if you widened a road, you're only gonna have to treat your additional impervious area, which is very minimal compared to Comfort Lake. All the accesses around Forest Lake uh, fall within Comfort Lake, Forest Lake, Watershed District rules. So any lineal project, there is no lineal exception that's been adopted you know, more metro-wide and the rules are much stricter on those projects, thus why a lot of our street projects have been tailored to, at the most, a full depth reclamation. Because we don't want to purchase space or uh, construct expensive BMPs and then come with the maintenance when we can do alternatives. But you see the condition of North, North Shore Trail, right? Uh, there's a lot of bad spots and that's, you know, you're probably now looking at some deeper cut fills uh, to reconstruct that roadway and then you know once you trigger their rules if you uh, disturb the underlying uh, materials in that watershed district that's when you can have a required to do stormwater management stuff and then then we need to find a place to do so right and you know that's been the conversation at some time when and if we reconstruct the roadways we'll have to deal with it at that point uh, one area we know coming up is that peninsula point on the north between first and second lake, all that sanitary sewer in there needs to be removed and relayed because of all the, the belt um, sags and uh, very shallow services and double lift station there, then you can eliminate all that by laying new gravity, getting rid of all the sags so everything flows to one single spot and we put a new lift station and then reconnect all the services. But the only way to do so is you're gonna to have to reconstruct a road with that because it's such a skinny road around there. There's nowhere else to put the pipe, read hook all the services. So that area, we've uh, turned some applications down. That's, 
we still have that existing right away so we can preserve those areas to treat the stormwater when that project comes in. It's kind of slated for 2022 or 23, 22 or 23 when the next lift station bond would come forward uh, to finance the, the sewer portion of that project. So that's, that's things that we kind of deal with and try to work around or will have to work around with. And uh, if, let's just say, especially in the south end of the, the lake, lake one there, you got hydrants at the end of some of those areas, and if you vacate uh, right away, you know, the right away splits both ways, uh, and then now you have to come over the top of that and record an easement. So who's, who would pay for that kind of stuff and stuff like that? So those are just a few of the scenarios we deal with. Uh, we got other areas we know that some stormwater washes out into, and then upon financing our street project someday, we know we'll be able to just have an easy connection with the treatment bay before discharging directly into the lake. Um, but we do get a lot of conversation and it's, it's hard. I mean, it's been, you can spend a lot of time on this and then, you know, according, I think, uh, planning that some of these plots even have recordings to allow this to certain lots and stuff too. So who's gonna do that research and stuff like that. Those are just a few things that I've been asked in the past and no, I've, we've had to talk about it, and I'm sure there's more, but. Yeah, right, no, thanks, I, I just want to add, um, so this is, periodically the city has conducted these sort of inventories. Uh, last time was in 2008. You know, we have records of the, the town doing it in, in 1989. Um, and there's another piece to the, these where, you know, because people have these access, maybe they don't have, you know, let's say on Fifth Street here, um, they don't have, it, you know, direct um, lake, you know, lake shore, you know, and part of their property, but, you know, I think it does confer a value all the way, all the way down Fifth Street to have that access. Um, so f as far as like a, you know, city tax revenue um, standpoint, uh, you know, those, those properties probably do assess higher because they do have that sort of access available to them, you know, it's in which people find desirable, you know, even if they don't have the, you know, immediate um, lakeshore to enjoy. All right. Why don't we open the floor up, let Lewis and Mark speak if you want to, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. Uh, Bruce Anderson, 9505 North Shore Trail. Um, Donovan, can you go to Third Lake? And mm -hmm. I think you know where my house is, Donovan. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's a spring drive is the... Uh, access point between uh, Mark and myself. Uh, I can only speak for the last 14 years since I've been there. Um, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Bain for coming out and taking a look at it. It's, it's an area that really has no value of a public access. Uh, down, probably the last third down by the lake is full of buckthorn trees and there's, there's really no way anybody from the public would ever use it. In my 14 years, I've had one car try to drive down there and because of the deterioration of the blacktop area, her wheel went off the road. A couple of elderly ladies thought that was a road, had to help them out. Um, there's no maintenance been done on it for 14 years. There's some, I believe, some old dying oak trees on there that um, the city's gonna have to be liable for. I think if anybody tries to walk down there, the steepness of and the poor condition of the blacktop, it's a liability to the city. Um, I know for myself, Mark and I would like to keep that area or make it a clean, nice area. There was a sister uh, access, oh, five, six houses down, which the city did vacate, and now that looks really nice. Uh, we'd like to do, kind of do the same thing. I understand there's a pump station at the, uh, near the road that's going to be replaced and done well, so we understand there'll be an easement <coughs> down for access to that pump station and sewer. So um, I will be applying for this vacation of, of that particular one. And again, I think it, there's, I can't see any benefit to the city to hang on to this one. I, I just think it's a liability and uh, look forward to you vacating it for us. Thanks. Thank you. And Mark? Uh, 
Hi, uh, just, I'm Mark Wilde, 9509 North Shore Trail. And I would like to echo what uh, Bruce has just said. Uh, my family has been there. My grandparents bought uh, the lot in the mid-1920s. And we uh, bought it from my parents in 1973. So we've been there for 45 years. And um, the use down by the lake, and uh, I, I also would like to thank Council Member Bain because she came and she saw exactly what we have down by the lake. It's not a usable area. Uh, there's the water drains down from the road, it crosses our driveway, then goes into the uh, spring drive and then down to the lake. And I would expect that that's going to happen no matter what you do to the road. Uh, he was talking about the sister access. That sister access also not only has a lift station on it, but it has a force main that goes all the way down to the lake and cuts over uh, Kitty Corner across to um, the next lift station on the other side. And uh, I just believe that uh, each one of these should be evaluated separately rather than a, a blanket no, we're not going to look at it because uh, this one definitely has got a different perspective to it. Uh, the DNR has already said that they have no uh, interest in holding on to it. Uh, and Bruce was also talking about some oak trees. My wife called in uh, the fall of 2016 and said there's a dead oak tree there. And called the city and then she called uh, again in the spring of 2017 and that oak tree is still standing there and it's dead and it presents a liability to the city basically because uh, it could fall on any direction fall on a house we have grandchildren that come there so there could be injuries so and there's a second one that's a little farther down that should be looked at too but uh, I just ask uh, that a blanket approach doesn't be taken to this because uh, some of these, uh, it's only a 20-foot access, too. So I thank you for listening, and I, uh, again, appreciate Council Member Bain from looking at the uh, property. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Beard? Yeah. Dick Cheetah, 21833 Healy. I guess that uh, you, sh you should be privileged to some of the information of the past, uh, especially those easements and, and uh, properties that uh, are in the old township, all right? They were all uh, looked at and went through the public hearings for the use on them a number of years ago and the commitment to the public was uh, finalized in the legal form of a commitment for usage. Uh, for example, it might be a walking easement. It might be one of the other types of easements. Part of the reason for that was, as these gentlemen talked of liabilities, and to have rules and regulations without committing the city to the liability side of it. And uh, that meant that uh, uh, it was, there was controls on these easements. There's also um, rules and regulations that follow the vacating process as to who gets the vacated land and rest of that. And there was a lot of conversation. I don't know if um, the city has the past records, but I do. I have all the documents. Um, I think that if you propose to vacate in a blanket form or any other form without going through 
the public process, you will not only fill this building, but the parking lot with them. Because it took us, I think, three months of hearings, one by one for every one of these accesses, so the public had their input on both the use of the, of the property and the future of the property. So I would uh, suggest that uh, you handle this very carefully and look at what commitments were the past, because if you uh, have a copy of the annexation, the judge put in place all of the contractual issues that were from either side of the, uh, the city or the township remained in place. And I could foresee that if you started going around the lake and vacating property, you might have a lot of response. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll open it up to the council for discussion. Ed? Yeah, I, I would just like to mention that I live on Clear Lake and there's, I guess for lack of a better term, it's a public access that nobody knows is a public access, but it's attached to what is now was a subdivision and now is, and those homes in that particular area, there's probably around 20 of them that have a right to use that. Most of the land, most of the homeowners don't even know they have that right. Is that a deeded access? And or I believe it's in perpetuity that uh, this exists. So to go back, the original landowners are long deceased. It would be a nightmare to straighten some of these out. And technically the land goes back to the owner. That was one of what, one of my questions on. So, if we vacate, what happens? Like, is is that an individual decision, or what? What is the process? Well, the process is, um, you know, anyone who wishes to vacate, you know, they actually, and this is, the C's, the way the C's dealt with it before, it's you know, citizen, you know, uh, um, petition action for this. Um, and there is uh, basically they need to provide. You know, survey actually show what they want to get, um, what they want to get vacated. Um, you know, give a legal description. There's a public hearing, and then at the public hearing, if the if the council then um, it's a direct petition to council, not through planning commission. Um, if council deems that there's no more public use of that, then it goes back to the to the original owners and basically split it halfway down the line. You know, to the adjacent property owners. Um, and, it's, and it is true what, what Dick said that, you know, some, in some of these cases, if these were, um, maybe there's some sort of public use ascribed to it and that that public use is removed, then it does go back to the original owner. And that, you know, that's just, that would, you know, and some of this actually happened with, uh, with Lighthouse <coughs> Lofts when the city was seeking to vac vacate um, Third Avenue and the city decided to do some licensing agreement, you know, Bridget and Jay, um, figure out a way to actually not have to go back and do about thirty thousand dollars worth of legal research to identify who this owner was from you know from 1946 or 48 um, and uh, but the uh, but it would it would be um, in the way we've ima staff has imagined it, it it would be citizen petitioned if they wanted to but also we recognize that if the city were to vacate them that really would start a precedent and we would really have a lot of conversation around this and you know, we do in our in city records. There is um, a copy of the um, some of the summary that, that the township did involving you know each of their access points. And for instance, the one that these gentlemen just discussed. It says Chippewa Heights. You know, with the address, lift station centered in the middle of access. You know, and from other ones, it says, you know, used for drainage, no parking, partially improved, used for drainage, no parking, unimproved, no parking. So there was kind of a description I, I don't we don't have more than that as far as you know what sort of contractual agreements that there were but it's my understanding that um, that ones there was a search to find out which ones could be vacated like the, for because um, a lot of these some of these were uh, you know dedicated for parks because with when the town in the town subdivision rules you had to dedicate seven percent of your your uh, of the subdivision um, plat to a rec, you know to, to a park and so they created lots of parks. Um, but again, if, it's, if the city takes away that use of a park, then it goes back to the original owner. 
But so it seems to me, it seemed to me like that they did the ex examination and, and it's my understanding that, that they already tried to pull out the ones that could be vacated back at that time. But, you know, that's, I don't have any, that's just my understanding. So in this particular situation, um, it was public access when Mr. Anderson purchased it. So what you, it would go back to the owner prior to him? Is that what, I just want to make sure I understand the process. You need to go through that history to. Well, no, unless it was, I mean, if it was just simply like a drainage utility easement um, right. implanted, I believe it would go to the, the current owner. I don't think it, okay. in this case okay. it would go back. But if it was dedicated for park, right. or uh, there's, there's some angle there too. Also, there's, this, you know, state, the state legislature could could remove that. There's a whole other <laughs> really complicated way to do that. But uh, give me one second. Yeah. Could I make a comment on that? Uh, Chippewa Heights that was platted as Spring Drive when Chippewa Heights was platted. So, so as whoever the owned it. Was, yep. so Got it. Was that from the origin? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Question I have does. Is the land technically owned by the city now? In these cases, yes. We examine this. Is what you see here is just simply the the the, the easiest way to visually represent it. But we have, you know, other. You know, I have. You know, more more um, more detailed. You know, description. Also, we have photos of each of these as well. And we went back to the original plats and where it said, you know, is an outlot or you know you know, this is deeded to the city. Um, that's what we focus on. Because there are other areas where are simply just city easements, you know, storm sewer pipes and whatnot, and this does not include those This areas. is not an easement. This is technically land owned by the city. Correct. But then in their defense, the oak tree situation, the city should take those down. Right? So I, yeah. I got the question. Uh, is Spring Drive an easement, or is that city-owned land? That's city-owned land. That was platted as part of the original subdivision. I'd be interested in seeing a map of them separated, what city owned, what's an easement. I can I can show it to you. And f follow on to that, is that a consistent is that a consistent for all of the access points that there is actually city owned land or are there some of them that it is an easement? Um and, and go ahead and answer his question first. I don't need to I think if it's the end of a road, it's always gonna be a city owned. City owned. So a public road. There may be other road. easements right. Right. like where the sewer line goes through or something like that might be more of an easement. But and in my thought process, if it's an easement, you can treat it, you know, I mean kinda of like a right of way permit where the adjacent landlords are gonna maintain it. Mm -hmm. And that takes care of half the uh, issue at, at hand. I would kind of think that it would be easy to vacate an easement if you're not using it or I don't see any future use for it. But if it's city-owned land, oh, that's, that's going to create a whole can of worms when you're trying to I think to treating those separate would probably be a good avenue to take. Yeah, I, I got quite the response when I asked about, you know, use of these, um, use of the access points. And I think the answer is it depends. And there's, you know, access the, the access point over here on the um, east side of Third Lake, you know, may not have been used in years. However, there's some of the other access points that are used frequently both winter and summer it's by a <clears throat> host of residents um, in the neighborhood. So I think it's tough to have a blanket policy because I think there's we're going to end up with variation, varying levels of public use and, you know, meeting, whether you meet that threshold of does it meet a public need. Well, and, I, you know, I, I've hashed this through a couple different times while being on the council. Um, no matter what, these have value. They do have value, um, right. But I think they may have more value than what we would ever get out of them, some of them. Um, each one has to obviously be treated individually, but, you know, what that future use could be, you know, and, and with the water treatment, with it being by the lake, you know, there's all those questions. I don't think it's fair that, um, we don't maintain them to the same standards as the residents would. Right. And that's where, you know, do we, instead of abandoning them, giving them back, splitting them, doing this, that, I mean, would it make more sense to explore the potential of, you know, uh, allowing 
the property owners on both sides to have ex you know more say exclusive use of that property but they have to maintain it and they have to you know i guess more rent it or lease it from the city as a private grounds because you know they are city owned but that doesn't make them free to the public to roam through them i mean we have other properties that are city owned i mean public works people can't just walk in and out and go through it city hall everything i mean these these are properties that are owned by us but, but that doesn't actually, make it like a park it, isn't it actually though i mean isn't it actually public access is permitted through those sections i thought yeah. I don't think in all of them that it's, oh, it's. Is that a universe? Is that a universal that public public foot traffic is allowed in all of them? That's pretty much universal. I mean, parking's restricted in many of them. A motorized vehicle um, is restricted. Um, but but it seems could, like that walking any access. Could, is, any kid could take a fishing pole and walk through any of them to yeah. get to and, the lake. Yeah, to try to stop that, you'd you'd end up in court. Right. Kind of on that point, I know there's um, there used to be some programs that thought it was through the DNR fishing in the neighborhood or something of the variation. There might be some uh, grant opportunities out there or something else. Uh, like Mr. Cheetah allotted to the fact that you know a lot of it was committed for public use. Potentially take one, two, or a couple of these and make them a little more usable under maybe a program such as fishing in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe something um, you know, it's snowmobile like traffic to other things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Ed, go ahead. And as far as the liability issue, it's city property right now. So, like that. <laughs> if they were say cleared and used, it was the city's liable. Not that in the case of those two landowners, their private insurance wouldn't be liable on that land. So, correct. I mean, you're creating a whole host of problems. Um, or they already exist, right? No, because with the they're un, it sounds like they're overgrown and not being used. If you cleared them for use. For use. Am well, I often the thinking that the easements we could all permit the adjacent landowners to maintain them? Well, but to worry about the city would still be liable. I mean, if you're going to maintain something, you're going to use it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use it, something happens. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, it's not mine. I'm aware of a handful of them where the other neighbors will split the, you know, the lawn mowing on it to maintain it, and they, they take some pride in it. Uh, Chief Newman's got a... Yeah, Mayor and members of council, there is a handful of these easements that we actually use for emergency services as well. Uh, mainly uh, winter just access. It's a lot quicker to uh, bring a person to one of those access roads than it may be to bring a victim all the way to the public landing. And then uh, during the 4th of July, uh, when the public landings are full, we may use one of these access to launch... Uh, or airboat if needed. Okay, thank you. Donovan, there seemed to be a lot of um, confusion on what was, where the lines were, and, and, and it sounded like some access points are marked with signage, but is it the case that not all of them have signage? And is, is there a rule of thumb of what's marked, what's not marked, or? No, there really hasn't been. I think it's been, it's been based on demand, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, or just the need that, you know, because if there was parking, you know, a lot of them do have to, like, you know, I think the most frequent thing is no parking. Um, or, you know, there's some of these are, are surprised to me. Um, there, and there's another issue I wanted to bring up, which is some cases there are actual docks here. This is one, again, off Third Lake in those little channels um, off of Jeffrey. There's two here, and this actually has a dock on it, and a few. Um, and I'd like to get some council direction on. Is this something, you know, is this a lease opportunity, for instance? You know, if someone is, is getting private benefit, um, and, and I think they would probably claim that, it, you know, they want to get the exclusive use of it, um, though there's really no legal claim they can make with that. It's just um, they were the first person to get there, really. The other thing is, I mean, in some cases, if you had an 85-foot lot and say there's a 20-foot easement next to you and you could technically claim that's yours, but then when you say you wanted to expand and all this, you couldn't build because it's not yours. You, so you, I mean, yeah, we are seeing. I know in our our neighborhood, there's one where there's a a stone fire pit, pretty fancy, located on what technically isn't their land. 
on on that South Shore of Clear Lake. Mm -hmm. um, but on your street or on, I mean, on your private street? On 210. On 210, okay. Well, that's one of the ones that's been contentious is the one over by um You know, Belkin. so they're kind of like, well, I'm maintaining it. I'm cutting the grass, so I'm putting my fire pit there. You know? And mo yeah, most of them are maintained. They look nice. Oh, it looks people beautiful. Take them and, Unfortunately, and, and, it's not their land. You know? Yeah, yeah. They, there's that sense where they go overboard with actual, doing, imp you know, improvements or storage of their, their trailers, for instance. So, I mean, I just think you're opening up a can of worms if you... Uh, we even look at something like that. Mm -hmm. I think there's, I agree if there's ones that aren't like clearly overgrown, not being used, but I think there's other ones that are frequently used and could benefit from some more clearer signage or something. So there's just better understanding between those that are using it and the property owners. Otherwise, I think you end up with people creating their own <clears throat> informal rules, which over time may or may not work. Is, is this something Parks, Park Six and Trails has looked at recently, or would it be worth having them take a look at? I mean, I haven't heard this since I've been on the council, but I'm very interested in bringing it to them, see if they have any good input on it. There's, I mean, there also um, we've had some conversations with uh, with Comfort Lake, Forest Lake, Washington District, because some of these areas could be places for stormwater um, quality improvement mm -hmm. projects. Um, so that can be improved that way with with little city cost, but definitely some coordination. Um, and, I, and they do kind of exist as pocket parks. I mean, I think it'd be a good, you know, Park Selection Trails Commission discussion around that. Now, currently, public access is just foot traffic on them then? No motorized vehicles, four-wheelers, snowmobiles, anything like that? Well, I mean, I think there, there are many that do have the snowmobile access. Um, and I think most of the signage, again, we can kind of, you know, I, I haven't assembled all the, the photos to of each individual one to show you the signage. Mm -hmm. um, most, mostly I think it relates to motorized boat launching um, because a lot of them just do have the, you know, the snowmobile, you know, traffic in the wintertime. Which, which I've received some complaints on some of them that, you know, the snowmobiles come just fast or they're not just strictly within the, the you know, the city property. The snowmobile club approach is not too long ago looking for more access in and out of town and across the lake too. Back to the other? back to the tree liability issue. Um, I do think it's worth us taking a look at. I mean, to the extent it's ours and we've got a dead tree that's hanging over somebody's house, which is the situation. Um, I'd rather us address that now than. Well, I'd after like a to storm. find out why it wasn't. I mean, we have we do have a ticketing system if somebody calls in, right, or emails in. Yeah, I'll look into the, the ticket. I'll look into see what happened with the complaint and, and touch base with Dave about. What can be done to mitigate that, or what's the liability on the city side as well? So, mm -hmm. we'll do some investigation on that for you. All right. Um, any other input on that, or where's the council wants to stay where we're at with it? Send it to Parks, Lakes, and Trails for some further input. And yeah. no, I would like to follow up on a little more definition as to are they easements or are they lake access what are they yeah, yeah. what's public what's and yeah exactly and what and what's what an easement? can the public actually use versus no they, it's not a public access because it's just an easement agree there's a parks trails lakes meeting tomorrow but it's not on the agenda i would like to talk to jamie tomorrow can you uh email me a, a list of the separation of the um easements versus yeah, yeah. Actually, what, this this other record I have, um, you know, this does, um, sh you know, point out the plats. And if it's platted, you know, I just don't want to make the whole blanket statement that there, there are no easements. But I believe it is the case that these are all platted, you know, because I did really. Platted. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm not 100 percent certain, but I think there are because there are other ones like where the force main was that was was referenced, that is just simply easement, um, you know, this. So, like, the two you have shown right there, those are both? Platted. I think it was part of that. that but they're both not, I mean, are they non-buildable lots or what? They were platted as out lots, um, deeded to the city. Um, I mean, it seems like there could be buildable area, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering if, um, and maybe Mr. Cheetah has more information on this, if, you know, this, the research was done here to, to indicate that 
if the city did, you know, sell this off or whatever else, you know, took away the public use, that it would go back to some original owner. Because it looks, I mean, it, that one looks decent. This, you know, both of these really, but you know, I could show or you. Or if you combine the both of them, I mean, you could have one really, you know, large single lot anyway. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I, I think really between um, Parks, Lakes, and Trails and maybe even Planning Commission that, you know, they review all of them. Um, and the other thing I've seen is there's areas where, you know, we have multiple close together. Um, you know, every street, every block has uh, access on it. Um, it seems like a significant amount of access points to the lake. And... I don't know if that's the best thought pattern. I mean, if, if, if they were in the hands of the property owners, I think they'd get uh, better care and not necessarily uh, promoting giving them to them, but I think that, you know, there are certain ones that should be dealt with. Um, the less access points there are, the less headaches we're going to have, uh, less issues in the neighborhoods, things like that, but... Um, How many are there total? They're about 34, 34 um, on Force Lake. And three on Clear you know, Lake. Plus the two... It's kind of disproportionate. <laughs> yeah, and the DNR access yeah. points. And yeah. I'm, so I'm not opposed to a vacation if the case can be made, um, but I guess I'm just becoming more and more aware of the reasons not to have a vacate, and I think we should be... Um, cautious on doing a vacation because I think whatever you set up as that precedent is going to set up the precedent and to Mr. Cheetah's point we will have a room of people <coughs> looking for a vacation and looking for additional yeah you know I mean we have a whole park on the north side of we do right that doesn't get maintained correct you really have to take a close look at all of them or, or any any one particular one because once they're gone they're gone that's it that's, that's and another it point you won't it, get it, just, it would never happen. Have to get it back yeah, so I, I th the, mm -hmm. the thought of even vacating one is pretty scary as far as I'm concerned. Dick had a question. I think it would be ben <clears throat> very beneficial to you uh, to have a good understanding of the difference between an access and an easement. Mm -hmm. Easements are specific. The, it can be only used by those that it is identified use and uh, well, the city has easements on my property but nobody else does and so consequently that's an, that would be an easement and access and you have a number of accesses that are public buildable lots they're public that are worth yeah. in the neighborhood of 400 to 500 thousand dollars I would not want to see you make a decision to vacate those lots and give half to the two neighbors, believe me. <laughs> oh, that's why I was saying there's a lot of value to some of those. That's uh, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of property out there, and I think that uh, uh, Donovan has uh, a bit of that information, but uh, the properties were clearly identified size-wise, uh, capabilities, uh, maybe not in the draft that you have, but in, in the minutes and, and documents from the township, they were. All right, thank you. And Good. the uh, minutes from the meetings that took place for the public hearings were all public, and they filled the hall. Believe me, you can't believe how many people are going to show up when you tell them they can't go across or they can't use that or the snowmobile can't go there. Yeah. Ed. There yeah. was some real serious information. Well, one of the other comments I'd like to make, talk about the value of the land. Uh, if you look at Forest Lake, I think 85, lot, 85 feet of frontage is just the land is worth about $385,000. So you're looking at how much a foot? I mean, that has value, that land. So I'd be, I'd be very reluctant to just turn it over to somebody. The biggest thing I'm concerned with is the liability on it, and you don't need to mow it weekly to consider it maintained. Um, you know, our sewer lines every three to five years being visited is enough to call it 
um, responsibly maintained. So I think that we should also look at an in-house, maybe talk to Dave, what's a realistic uh, evaluation expectation that public works or contract service could, you know, maybe rough cut once a year or, or at least visit the trees in their well condition to avoid a, a liability um, we kind of heard about tonight. Mm -hmm. Something that's not going to be detrimental to the city's budget for maintaining properties that get minimal use, but still mitigate uh, any risk. Yeah, well, like, I, I don't know. It, it, to me, trees are nature. I mean, I don't think that opens us to any any liabilities we don't have already. Well, we should, I mean, but, you know, if a tree on our uh, right away, you know, it's going to happen. That's that's there, whether it's, you know, live or dead, the storm blows it over or whatever. But, yeah, if, if we're not maintaining them to a reasonable standard, I mean, that's got to be taken care of. And I'd like to find out if, if there was called in, you know, why something wasn't dealt with in any way. So, um, <clears throat> so we're going to... Uh, Get some input from the Parks, Lakes, and Trails Commission on it. Um, potentially public works as to, you know, which ones are needed. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, I just don't, you know, just uh, council, I don't know if there's really any motivation to delve into this subject anyway. Um, I, I still think, you know, the property owners along both sides of these that, you know, have to deal with them day to day or look at them day to day and are putting effort into it or, you know, just want to, you know, clean this thing up a little bit, you know, make it more neighborhood. There's got to be a way that we can accommodate that or, you know, make some exceptions for those particular access points. Um, I agree it, it would be very tough to give most of them up or um, the ones that are really needed. This one on spring with a lift station on it, you know, great example. There's a lift station there. I would hope we'd be able to um, not have to deal with these as more um, ransom with Clear Lake, Comfort Lake, if we do want to widen the roads I would just wish they would be willing to work with us logically on that but unfortunately without that there we may have to try to utilize these um, for that water treatment or for that uh, very frustrating that we'd have to do that but we may have to so and long term who knows what yeah. 10 20 years from now is going to bring yep but end of the day yeah I don't see any any resolution real soon unfortunately but uh parks lakes and trails hopefully you guys can maybe uh, prioritize some of them is either a priority to to get rid of them or a priority to keep them but um then it can go to public works and they can also state which one's necessary for them and and we can develop a list of you know where we need to be with them I was just going to say, like in Clear Lake, what used to be the public launch was abandoned, and when they put in a new launch, mm -hmm. which is adjacent property, but the homeowner, the very first homeowner there, has taken it upon himself as to put a rope across it, and that's his now. Mm. But I'm sure it's not. Yeah. So I think we're going to run into a So host people of those can't go fish there, they can't do anything. Yep. So. Yeah. I have no doubt there's a host of those issues all, all around. I think what, just to kind of summarize is maybe we'll take it back and try to put some next level of detail to some of these, including pictures of what they actually look like. It's one thing to look at them from, you know, literally 20,000 feet. It's another thing to look at them from the ground, you know, to kind of get some analysis there. Maybe Park Lakes and Trails can look at them for potential. Is there any potential use for improvements? Can we put signage up there to kind of encourage use or direct use to the certain ones, uncertain ones or not? And then maybe once all that kind of work has been done, I'll also go back to Dave and ask him about, you know, kind of a maintenance estimate, what it would cost to maintain them. I'll discuss with uh, Bridget and the insurance company just kind of what's the liability on these and kind of maybe repackage it. Because what I'm kind of hearing right now, there's not a lot of appetite to basically kind of go through and blanket vacate them or blanket keep them all. So it's still kind of maybe on a case-by-case -case basis. However, we're kind of doing some of that background work 
at one shot. So if one comes forward in the future, we'll kind of know, you know, what's all there. So we don't have to kind of keep doing the work, kind of keep going back. So we just have a document to go to and say, well, in 2018, we did this kind of deep analysis of it. Here's what we found. Can you give us some good reasons why we should vacate if we ever get to that point and kind of establish why we want to maintain use of it. So in the future, we're not having to kind of always go back to our archives and, you know, not necessarily waste staff time, but just kind of duplicate staff time and find the same information on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, I guess one other comment, but, you know, we're dealing with, say, 50 parcels at the most. Um, if there are some others that aren't around the lake, you know, maybe 100, but we're dealing with millions of dollars worth of city-owned property, basically. I think it would be nice to establish a policy that once a year, either Jamie or, you know, somebody visits each one of those, um, just assesses the physical condition of it. I mean, we look at our parks, we take care of our parks, but all these other pieces of land are out there that, you know, once a year, I just think it would be, we have the technology now, you know, snap a picture or two of it, put it in file, you know, next year, do the same thing. If there's dead trees, if there's other things, um, you know, if there need attention, it can be done. You know, we can do that in the middle of winter when, you know, parks don't need as much attention, something like that. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of money that's out there and um, we should be watching over it a lot better. A lot more money to buy it back in the future. Well, that's true. Uh, any other input on this discussion? All right. Let's move on then. Chief, I think you are up for a fire truck. Okay. So we've been talking about the uh, tender one. Uh, that had the crack frame. And just to give a, a quick, quick description of that truck, it's an 85 Ford LTS 9000, 25,000 miles, 300 gallon tank, 500 gallon per minute uh, pump on it. Uh, it's got severe rust jacking on the frame and the steel crater that supports a stainless steel tank has cor corrosion on uh, both sides. Uh, basically making the truck unusable. Unus so at the last couple of council and workshop meetings, uh, you had tasked me with looking into a couple different options uh, for direction on the truck. So the first thing I did is I contacted four different uh, repair companies, uh, uh, well-known uh, companies that have the ability to do that kind of repair. Uh, three out of the four uh, companies said they weren't interested in doing any repair work on the truck that they felt that the truck was too far gone uh, to be able to do any repair. We did end up with one uh, estimate from Storm Manufacturing. He initially placed a bid in and then came back and revised it. Uh, uh, that bid was for $46,500. And basically that was to replace uh, both frame rails and then replace the cradle around the stainless steel truck, which basically means that they have to dismantle everything on the truck, repair it, and uh, put the truck back together. Uh, pretty well involved truck. It would be out of service for a minimal of 90 days uh, if the council chose to, to go that direction. Uh, the second uh, thing that I looked into was fire truck rentals. Uh, unless you're having a birthday party or a bachelor party, uh, it just isn't an option. Uh, there was one company out east that did it, but uh, when it came to tenders, their newest tender uh, was like an 89. So uh, that really wasn't an option. Uh, looked at the lease option. There's three different uh, lease options to go with. Uh, but there isn't one that is uh, economical. Uh, the best le lease option is a rent to own, and that's about 3.5 to 4.5 uh, interest rate over the uh, life of the lease, and then basically you own it when the lease is done. The other two options are just considerably more expensive. 
looked at our neighboring departments to find out if anybody had recently re uh, replaced a tender. Uh, the only one out there that I found was uh, Linwood Fire. The truck that they replaced was an 85 Mac, which is the uh, a year older than uh, the truck that we currently have. Uh, 3,000 gallon tank, 500 gallon per minute uh, pump on it, but it's a DNR truck and it's due back to the DNR uh, at the first of the year. It's just their lease uh, arrangement. Uh, I did check into, this wasn't in our lease, or our uh, things that you looked or wanted me to look into, but I did look at the DNR surplus to see what was available out there. Uh, what we found there, uh, the newest truck that they have uh, that can be used for a tender is nine years old. Uh, they get 5,000 uh, for the truck itself. Uh, comes with no warranty. Uh, I did talk to a department that had gone through uh, that whole deal that was Pine City Fire Department. Um, what I found out and I talked to the DNR, those are six wheel drive military trucks. They're used for hauling uh, tanks around. Uh, you can put a 3,000 gallon tank uh, on the truck, but you need to stretch the uh, frame, build a subframe, uh, add a poly tank paint. Uh, there's no warranty on the chassis. It's about a year turnaround. Uh, you'll get a year on the body. Uh, when Pine City did it, it was about 150K, uh, but there's a lot of things that are on the Pine City uh, uh, truck that they just didn't do that uh, because of the way that they operate. They didn't put a pump on it. Uh, and so there was two other uh, fire departments that, that went that direction, and that cost was between 180 and 200,000. Uh, some of the considerations with talking with Pine City uh, was six wheel drive trucks are expensive to repair. Everything in those vehicles are military switches. Um, truck height and clearance issues was a big deal for them because these trucks are higher than a normal fire truck sits. Um, and so they're not user friendly for operators and the no warranty on the chassis. So you're buying a, a truck that is already nine years old, it only costs you 5,000, but then you have to do a whole bunch of uh, fabrication to make that vehicle work. It's, it's an option, uh, but it's an expensive option. Uh, the used tender market, uh, you kind of got to look at it like a pyramid. Uh, up on top of that pyramid are trucks that were just recently built, and same with price, they're very expensive, um, as you get down with older trucks, there's more and more of them. The range is anywhere from uh, 30,000 to 200,000. One of the issues that you uh, run in with that uh, used tender market is a lot of these are picked up at auction. Some of the newer models will come with a, a maintenance uh, history, but when you start getting some of these that are a lot older, uh, that maintenance history may be unavailable. Uh, and when talking with um, a lot of the chiefs that I talked to, one of the issues you have with, with tenders versus other trucks is when a, when a municipality buys a tender, it's basically a water hauler. It's got a smaller pump on it. The functions um, are not as complex as your regular engine or uh, engine tenders. And so these municipalities will buy these trucks and they'll hold on to them for 30 years before they flip them. And so when you get a... Uh, a tender that's a newer tender that's been purchased and sold, it's usually because there's a big issue with the vehicle, and that's why these departments dumped them, because the municipalities typically will buy a truck and hold on to it for a long time unless it doesn't either meet their needs or there's a uh, maintenance issue where they've determined it's just more expensive to um, keep the truck than it is to uh, purchase a truck. And then the uh, last, um, Thing that I looked at is for uh, a new tender purchase, but not uh, where we go in and we spec out uh, uh, the vehicle. Because once again, this is just a water hauler uh, 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 that has a water pump on it. Now, I don't mean to downplay the complexity of it, 
uh, because uh, there are things that uh, you know we use the tenders for in firefighter um, um, operations that they're they're very important. But like Rosenbauer has what they call a stock um, tender, and so you basically don't have all the bells and whistles that you have with other trucks. And uh, they had a 3,000 gallon, 500 gallon per minute pump uh, that runs for about 237,000. So in that around 250,000, uh, not to exceed range. Um, they actually have one uh, that's on hold if the department takes it, then that option's gone. Uh, and that's about 210 to 270 days out. Uh, if you order one. If you order a custom truck, you're looking at a year. Uh, with the other things that I had talked about, if you go a lease option, that's a year out. If you go with a DNR surplus truck, that's a year out too, because all those things need to, to uh, get built and they go in line with all the other um, vehicles. So there, there, there isn't a lot of good options here um, for tenders. So I'm looking for direction from the council on which way to go. Is the truck here? Mm-hmm. Well, let's take a recess and go look at it. Okay. I haven't had a field trip yet. <laughs> what are we gonna see? I wanna see the brakes and the framing. Right? See what it looks I mean, like. Yep. I'd like to get a more of a visual of what we're looking at. Than when you had 
dedicated property as fulfillment for um, uh, the, if you want to call it, parkland commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, get it either 10% or 10% of land or 10% in money. Okay. And a lot of developers looked at it and they said, well, we'll give, we'll give them just a piece of land over here that looks like a swamp. We'll give them that piece. And that's exactly what the they did. Area, right? That's exactly what they did too. Well, look at look at what that property is right on the curve on uh, down there. That uh, old middle house property. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. executive uh, building site. Yes. Yeah. Now you figure that one out. Yeah, we're just up from that. We're uh, like Spring Drive is uh, probably about ten houses to the south of the boat launch. Okay. On the hill. Up on the hill, yes. Yeah. And the water has always run across, you know, as they added layers to the road, the water yeah. is always, uh, it used to go right down Spring Drive, the, the access. Yep. Yeah. And of course, as they added more and more layers to the road, now it comes across our driveway, then goes to oh, the sure. yes. yeah. so, but But the key to it was, you know, nobody is doing anything, like I said, that, that tree has been there for two years dead. And <laughs> well, I think that originally the legal opinion from the attorney uh, was that you were better off leaving it unimproved mm -hmm. because you didn't have any liability then. It was natural land, the contour was there, and all your liability was like on the pump station or the line, you didn't have to deal with like some of them where people that are one tier back, well, we want to go down to the lake, so we need a place to walk to the lake. And then they carried their canoe to the lake. Yeah, I and then understand that. Yeah. But, but across there, just about all of those lots are now owned by the people on the lake. Right. And, uh, well, I didn't tell you, you knew Vern Vesca. Oh, sure, I knew Vern. Okay, well, we're right next to we his old place. place. Yeah. yeah, except that that's, uh, that's gone now. But. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I know exactly. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I, I think that uh, in the past there was, and there is, there's dedicated access to the lake that is really an easement, and they have to clarify that. Because the access is public, easements are not public. Exactly. They're either dedicated to someone or a, a development, and we have those. Okay. Houses back one tier, 10 houses on this, perhaps well, this easement. A lot of people across there thought that the, uh, they had a dedicated access. It would, in other words, if they had a dedicated access, they could put a dock down there. Right. But there is no, it's I, I went down and got all of the deeds across yeah. there. And and there was, if it isn't on the deed, it's not and dedicated. None of them were dedicated, you know. So they could put a dock down there, so correct. they just yeah. didn't care, so they didn't you know, stop using it. Yeah. And it just kept growing up, and, and right now it looks like a jumble. So, oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, but, but as far as the trees go, if it's on a public property and they can show that there's a hazard there, They've got a little bit of concern. Well, they should have. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, they should have. Yeah. And I think this kind of woke them up tonight, too, because uh, uh, that tree you know, is dead, and it died from, uh, it looked like it went from oak well. So those are supposed to be taken down anyhow. But, yeah. So I think that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, nobody's using it anyhow, so it really matters. Well, there's no place to park. See, I, I, I agree with you in and, 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 and the fact that, that uh, every one of these should be looked at on an individual basis. Yeah, look at the contour of the land, look at the size, there's 10 foot, there's 20 foot, there's 80 foot. Yeah, yeah. And I, so I agree. obviously there's a difference and there's uh, uh, the use, of, the available use on it should be a consideration. You know. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a bit. They, they don't have to deal with these 
street accesses because they're street accesses. That's it. You know, they're not, there's nobody. Well, they, they closed a couple of them over here on the South Shore. And, and uh, what they did was they uh, prohibited people from launching boats. Sure. They put posts in yep. or a chain across. And, and you, you know, you, you create some liabilities there too. So, you know, um, but and and maintenance, hey, it's not, none of this is being maintained. This well, is, I, don't, I don't know if you've been out on that lake, but it's not very, very nice this year. Yeah, it, well, ours, it's only probably about 75 feet from the lake. And that we cut the grass, you know, up there. When they first put the lift stations in there, their idea was that they were going to put a little place for the trucks to drive in, and they kept putting class 5 gravel there. Mm -hmm. Well, every storm, the class 5 gravel will end up in both of the yards. Yep. And so, uh, several, I can't even remember what year it was, but probably in the early 80s or somewhere in that area, uh, they had a project going on, and they had some extra black. Mike Page was a fantastic guy. Uh, just came and he said, we got some extra black top. You want us to get rid of the class five? You want us to, I said, great. Yeah. Yeah. And so they did, they went, they went down the water runs on that, but now that's washing out too, and they aren't doing anything with that, so. Well, it's just a matter of uh, a little bit of tender love and care from the city would be uh, to take care of it, but. Well, you know, if you look at this lake and Clear Lake as the two biggest assets we have, sure. Um, and you look at, and, and uh, uh, there's no question in my mind, over 70% of the residential taxes paid in the city of Forest Lake are paid by lake owners. Oh, I, yeah, I when you look at the, you know, they say that the property across is made better by that, but you look at the ones right across the street from us, and they're, they're not that good at all. Yep. And, and, and that's, you know, and so you would think that the priorities and the allocation, you know, of responsibility for the community would lead that way. So is that way that's true? I don't know. Time. Can't tell you how much it's been etching at me. So, probably shouldn't go start rolling on stuff right now. Loading at night. Well, hopefully, we can break it. You need to fix it. So. I got Wednesday off work. I got a world tour bracing on the box for the Ford. Hmm. So, it'll still get used. There you go. I'm surprised that the Ford people aren't going to hand it to the Ford. Sorry. A little greasy. A lot of work under there. Mm, a lot of stuff down there. And it's triple frame, so it's well, just and you got the double pumpkins there, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You got to drop all that before you can even get it. You understand the expense now? Hmm? I understand the expense now. Yeah, I don't know if it's anywhere near what they're... What do they want? 45000 or something? 40, 46000 That's yeah. still... Relatively cheap versus buying a new one or used one or any of them. Well, um, I got well, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand. You know, you know, depreciate ten, fifteen thousand a year anyway. Yeah, but you're not so going to lose anything on this one. Oh, you're already depreciated. Yeah, you're from here now. Fix it. Yeah. Well, you up for a place. That's the ironic thing is that they're up with two pumper trucks that are up before this thing. So at least it's better that if we fix it, it's not going to go away within nine months. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but he's going to Yeah, because he said it runs like a watch. <laughs> All right, let's uh, reopen the meeting here. Thank you for the tour. A um, couple of questions to start off with is, whoops. Um, <laughs> Linwood had, or you contacted them, they have to give that truck back to the DNR. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that, you know, that truck is in better condition than ours is. Would we be able to get that truck or contact the DNR? I mean, I don't know what they're going to do to dispose of it, but I, there can't be much of a market for it. So where I'm going with it is, in my mind, yes, we have to replace that truck. But it's also going to take a year plus to get what we need mm -hmm. out of there. And in the meantime, can we get it, that truck to put in service short term until, you know, so we don't have to settle for something that isn't quite what fits our needs here in Forest Lake? Yes, I know Linwood just put $8,000 into the front end of that vehicle. Um, I have not seen it. I did talk to... Uh, the fire chief there. Uh, it, it doesn't have the pump system like our pump system has, but it is, uh, just take a look at that. It does have a 500 gallon a minute uh, pump on it, which is you know, the minimal size that we're looking for. I don't see it as a long-term solution, but for a short-term solution, uh, you know, while we came up with a different plan, uh, may be viable. Uh, they just, we would be able to uh, uh, take delivery of the truck up until the first year, and then it'd have to be a paperwork. Uh, whether that truck would even have to leave our station, um, it just to get it off of Linwood's books to the DNR's books and back onto our books um, would be the process. Um, Linwood's already taken delivery of their uh, new tender, so that is something that uh, uh, that is an option. Uh, I haven't seen the vehicle, uh, but it seems in, to be in fair running condition at this point. That's something we could park here essentially tomorrow if. If it went through. Yeah, I mean, it is something that I definitely want to go, you know, I was looking for guidance from the council today. I'd want to go take a look at it and just make sure uh, uh, that's operational and it's going to fit our needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. The uh, repair estimate was 40 some thousand, right? It was 46,500. The tank cradle also, or was that yes. strictly? Nope, that uh, basically what that would repair uh, is. Frame rails and tank cradle. Uh, there is uh, a little. And the lead time to get that done? Uh, 90 days around. Yep. And uh, you know it all depends on how busy they are at the time, uh, but around that time frame. Uh, the only other thing is, is the cabinetry that we've got currently on there is good on front, side, and back, but we do have some rust holes going through. Uh, uh, the bottom uh, which they could repair when it's off well I mean that would be the time to do it and that wasn't included in this estimate uh, but I can't imagine that that would add too much because it's all at the same level and it should be as simple as just putting in a plate across the whole bottom you know it is it, something that we're just <coughs> buying uh, time with that truck uh, that was not on the CIP because before this point, I mean, that truck's been a great truck. Everybody, um, uh, it's easy to operate. It's low maintenance cost. Uh, people are used to it. Uh, fits in the Because the drive station. train and everything in there is solid. Good. Solid, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It you know it costs us roughly, um, on average for the last three years, maybe $1,000 to $1,500 a year for maintenance. And some of that's just... Um, uh, the certification that each truck has to go through each year. So it, it's, it's not compla complex, it's a mechanical versus a uh, computerized vehicle, but it is 33 years old. Um, it, it's a truck that goes out um, not on every run, uh, you know, primarily when we have larger grass fires or structure fires. 
Um, it is a truck that gets used for mutual aid, of course. When we have mutual aid, they come in and help us as well. So um, when it does go out, it's an, it's an important piece of our fleet. I got a handful of questions for you. Yeah. Is uh, that repair going to be considered a permanent long-term solution? No. You know, when we did the um, restoration of the truck for five years, our hope was to get 10 years out of it. So uh, that truck does show up on the CIP uh, in five or six years from this year. Um, so when I say it, it, it's not on the CIP um, completely, I, I've got our CPL, C, um, CIP dated for 25 years out and kind of figured out where the truck replacements are. Um, in the current five-year CIP, it's not on the books at this point. So um, we were hoping that that truck would take us to, you know, 2023 in that ballpark. Well, I'm just the pair in itself is, recap, they're going to be cutting and putting in new frame, gusseted, or is it going to be spot repair how, how much are they replacing on that frame there? well they're going to replace the whole cradle just because it's corroded all the way around yep. and then um where the frame rails are they'll cut it at the um cab of the truck and then replace it all the way uh back uh, i assume that's gonna be a blast and recode of at least the tail end of that frame you're getting into g whiz mechanical stuff now <laughs> They're going to be repainting, I mean... Oh, they'll have to repaint because... The whole tail end of that frame, so we're not going to anticipate rust showing up next year in a different spot. Yes, yep. And they'll, they'll actually, in that quote, um, all those exterior cabinets are actually bolted onto the stainless steel tank. So when Rosenbauer did the uh, previous repair, when they put the bolts on, they sprayed over the top of all those. So when they actually remove all those bolts, they'll have to repaint... Um, certain sections of the truck as well uh, just because when they remove the bolts you'll have big clumps where the paint come off where the paint's going to come off uh, lost my other question oh uh, yeah so what's the response time to the rural area um, from a neighboring tanker and I'm getting in there a little bit. Um, I mean, is this, is this... I was kind of prepared for this question. <laughs> so uh, from our station here, Wyoming's six miles away, Hugo's eight miles, Scandia's 10 miles, Lana Lake's 10 miles, East Bethel's 21 miles, and Linwood's 13 miles. So uh, when you start getting into the um, you know, northern suburb, but more south than we are, these stations are five miles apart. So when they do... Uh, mutual aid, they get pretty quick response. When we get, you know, a uh, call out in Carlos Avery, when you're coming from Linwood, Scandia, Wyoming, or Hugo, you're talking some distance. And uh, it's just not that, you know, Wyoming's the closest department to here, but when you start getting to the, you know, out in the uh, southeast area, Keywatton area, um, there isn't a close department. So by the time you, um, you know, call mutual aid, they get to the station, they jump in their truck and they arrive, you're talking 20 minutes. Yeah, so our response time, let's say picky Watton is, is a destination. If we had a structure file, we automatically page you out for mutual aid for structure fire, correct? Well, with the new CAD system, we're actually, um, our, uh, uh, attorney is reading or reviewing the auto aid agreements uh, with this new CAD system that we've got in Washington County one of the things that we haven't been able to do in the past is auto aid so uh, we divided our uh, fire territory into six different areas uh, and we'll actually have auto aid agreements with seven different fire departments which we've not had in the past and so that's definitely going to speed um, time up with um, uh, mutual aid, which will make a difference. Um, but our response, it, it all, I mean, there's so many different criterias that come into that time of day, weather, uh, winter, summer, snow, ice. Uh, but I would say on average, uh, when you get out to the uh, further areas, we're uh, in, in uh, Forest Lake area, we're probably 12 to 13 minutes on the farthest out. 
if you're talking uh, Columbus, it's probably a little bit uh, uh, longer response time. So, that, so first truck's going to be an apparatus for a structure fire, right? Mm -hmm. The tanker, how soon is your second truck leaving? Uh, what I'm getting at here is mm -hmm. um, we give you a five-minute window of our tanker. Our tanker would typically show up to when mutual aid would arrive. That means is that going to be a five-minute window? Or are we looking at 10, 15 minutes longer that we're going to be without water, without having a tanker here? Well, it all comes up into um, response, your, your neighboring response. What's their response like? Um, I give you a, 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 an example for the uh, standoff for the person lit the garage on fire, just because that was the most recent call. Yep. Uh, we were on scene. Uh, lit the garage on fire, pulled our engine one, which is our main uh, attack engine, uh, laid lines, pulled our engine two up to it. So we went through 1,000 gallons in that truck. We went through 2,500 gallons uh, in the next truck. Probably both of those were empty in um, five minutes. We pulled up our engine three, couldn't get water, um, the cable that hooked to the governor snapped. It's something that's a non-routine maintenance, um, uh, something that doesn't get checked at maintenance, just old trucks. So that snapped. We moved that out of the way. We had called Hugo 10 minutes before that. They were just going by uh, 97 and 61. When I called them and told them or asked them where they are, we had approximately 300 gallons of water at that time. So when they arrived, we were probably out of water for two minutes. They hooked up their um, tender, and I can't remember how many gallons of water that was, but we ran out of water again. Scandia was requested mutual aid probably six or seven minutes um, after Hugo was. And when we ran out of water with uh, Hugo, Scandia was about a minute behind. And so we got them hooked up as well. And so, you know, we're tender one was down we didn't have that ability um engine i believe engine three um snapped the cable on its governor i mean that it it's just the things that you run into but to answer your question we called mutual aid you know hugo was called prior to him lighting it on fire scandia was called right when he lit it on fire and we had already blown through yeah you you, Two trucks. So you explained it beautifully. Is kind of what I wanted. So I mean, to paint the picture that this, I mean, the tanker is essential for our fire district. Yep. Um, unfortunately, there is an event, but recently it paints a, a, a relevant need for it. So what I'm really leaning towards is, is trying to get a hold of that DNR truck that that, that Linwood had, ASAP. Yep. I, I would support that even at a, a, a moderate cost. Um, I don't like the idea of getting somebody else's uh, truck to the tune of, you know, a quarter million dollars. That isn't something you spec'd out. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm sitting on that. Um, yeah. I would like to have, if we're going to go down that road of buying a new truck, I want it to be one that we built, we designed. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Engine 3, Governor Cable Snap, how old is that truck? We bought both of those trucks in 1996, so they're coming up on so 23 years old. old. We've got one that's specced out um, in CIP for next year. Uh, that's going to run about 550000 You know, when we bought both those trucks, uh, initially back in 96, we bought them at the same time, uh, ran us about 700000 and just because of uh, cost of fire trucks today, uh, they're about 550000 So in the CIP, the way that that works is we've got that in CIP for next year, and then we don't have replacement for the other truck for another two years. And, and part of that is because it's 550000 Number two, what we didn't want to do that we did back in 1996, we ordered two at the same time. We've had, from the time that we've got received them, they've been lemons. We've had issue after issue after issue with those trucks. I didn't want to have two trucks that were purchased the same year because if, if you just get that batch that's an issue and it could be personnel, it could be for whatever reason, I don't want to go through that again. And then just to spread over the cost. But it, you know, it's a day by day thing. Um, 
with those engines just because of age. So did we uh, change the governor cable on the other one as well? We did not. Um, Might as well just do it to prevent Same it from hours. snapping anyway. Similar hours? Um, nope, actually engine three gets used a lot less than engine two just because it's in Columbus. Um, Definitely look into that though. But you know what, I would, other than a few uh, of the same similar items, it's all different things that happen in these trucks. You know, I can tell you that the latches for the water tanks, we've had to replace them multiple times on both trucks. The um, water tanks themselves, the poly ones, at this point, both of them are cracked. We've replaced them twice in both trucks. They've got a lifetime warranty, which is great, but it costs you 10 grand to get them out. So um, other than that, um, that laundry list is pretty high on the repairs that we've had for both of those trucks. But um, you know, on some of this stuff, because it happened in one truck, if you, if you start repairing on both trucks, our maintenance budget's just gonna go through the roof because it's different things on both trucks at different times. Okay. You mentioned that you also wanted to keep this tanker after it's replaced for training and just extra capacity? Well, not for capacity, just for, and, and not tender one, but the, the pumper itself. Um, I refer to the one that we need, that needs to repair right now. Say it one more time. The tender. Yeah, we did not want to keep that one. If we, if we, um, if we whatever route we go with a tender, um, that is a truck that we just want to send down the road. Um, because of the frame issues and the um, um, corrosion on the cradle itself, uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable driving it down the road. Um, you know, it'd be okay for training on the facility, and we had a training last Tuesday, and we used it here in the parking lot, but it's slow speed, all controllable. I wouldn't want to take it on public roadway uh, filled with water. So um, what we talked about is when we um, replace the uh, engine tender, at that time we would keep one of the tenders at least until the other one's repaired because if an engine or drivetrain go down, just because of the age, it may be cheaper to take it from one used truck and throw it on the other because they're identical trucks. And so we're kind of looking at it as while we're, while we're in the process of replacing, we'll use it as a training truck, but if we need spare parts, it may cheap, be cheaper to pull it off of the spare than it is to get new. So and that's kind of what the thought pattern behind that was. If we put the $46,000 in repairing this, this truck's not gonna disappear right away? Well, if we put the 46,000 into that truck, hopefully we're gonna get another five years out of the truck. Uh, but once again, it's 33 years old. So there, you know, we, we do all the maintenance every year. We keep it up to date. Um, you know, we're not lacking on any maintenance. A stainless steel tank, the tank's in great shape. Um, the hope would be to get another five years out of that truck. There is no guarantee with that. It's the same with the DNR truck. That's an 85 Mac. And so you're, uh, come, you're 33 years old there as well. Um, I know Linwood just put $8,000 in the front end of that vehicle, so that portion of it uh, seems in shape, but it's 33 years old. So, you know, the, the hope is to get time either way out of the trucks, but they're old. There's no guarantee. You guys do a good job with grants on other equipment. We, we got extra money in the budget at all this year, or what are we looking like? Um... We're not going to blow our budget by any means, but it's awfully early in the year for me to say here's exactly where we are. Um, I don't typically purchase very many items until the maintenance portion of the budget is done. Um, you know, we had a $30,000 bill um, two years ago, and we had a $20,000 bill last year on equipment, and we never had to, to come back to the city for additional funds 
because we were careful not to spend money until the maintenance was done. And when that happened, then we were able to control spending to make sure that we didn't um, uh, overspend. And in, you know, last year we got the grant for the air tanks. Uh, payroll was down, even though fire runs were up. And we were able to basically cover uh, the difference between the grant and the air tanks itself in the regular budget without having to come back to the city for additional uh, funds. So we've controlled our budget pretty well, but we're still only at the halfway point in the budget and don't know where truck maintenance is gonna end up, so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm good on that. All right. Um, we need a short-term solution and a long-term solution to the issue that's there. Um, relying on mutual aid, to me, is not an option. Um, no more than we would want to be responding to, you know, every fire in another jurisdiction. Uh, the Linwood truck seems like a plausible option at this time to carry us through until we can get the truck we need. But more than that, we've got so many pieces of equipment in the fire department that are going to need attention, going to need replacement coming up, including the, the two uh, engines you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And really the evolving needs of the fire department is probably more important to me. And that's where I think you, the chief, you, or you your people need to look at you know, what equipment are we going to need 10 or 15 years from now mm -hmm. so that we can get on the path of not just replacing an old truck with another truck every time, but equipping the fire department with the equipment you need to do 2020 firefighting, 2030 fire and rescue, not 1980 fire and rescue equipment. So I would like to see you know, the potential of, you know, you looking at that truck closer in Linwood before we make a final decision. Mm -hmm. But if that truck can get us a year or a year and a half out, that gives you enough time to spec out a piece of equipment. It also gives us a flexibility, I think, to get a better bid on a piece of equipment, knowing that, you know, we're not under time crunch and have to rush for something. But the third step of that is we need to look at your whole um, CIP of where the future is going so we can plan that out and know, you know, we've got expenses in that fire department coming up every year. We need to deal with that. I'd rather be proactive than just keep bonding for everything that can go along. I can tell you that the, the next three vehicles that are up, and I'm including this tender one as part of those three, them are all water driven. And so, uh, you know, we had a discussion here a couple months ago about uh, uh, different approaches, you know, purchasing different equipment that will reduce our overall costs looking forward. Right. Unfortunately, when it comes down to water, unless you hydrant the unhydranted areas for the next three trucks, we just don't have options. I mean, they're just, they're, um, uh, they make up 89% of our water the next three trucks do. So um, we can definitely look at CIP, you know, looking long-term in that 10 to 15 to 20 years, but the next three trucks, we just, as a city, we don't have any options on. I mean, they make up 89% of our water supply and with so many things like ISO that come into play with, um, you know, these volunteer departments uh, or paid on call departments around us, uh, you know, they're getting less and less volunteers, um, uh, just less and less commitment. So I, I agree with the comment earlier that, you know, mutual aid isn't uh, something that you can depend on uh, you, you know, these cities need to be self-sufficient with their water delivery systems and whether that be through, you know, adding infrastructure and hydrants, which is a heck of a lot more expensive than fire trucks, the next three trucks that we have coming up, there are meat and potatoes of, of um, the system. So 
Well, we always hear what, you know, what does city, you know, what do we do for the township? Yeah. Um, this is one of those things we do for the township. Um, not exclusively, but the need is there. <clears throat> oh, as much as anything anyways. Absolutely. If we didn't need um, tenders, trucks get a lot cheaper when you start getting, uh, you know, small, smaller water delivery um, systems. Yeah, I got a couple questions. One, tankers themselves, just a tanker. Mm -hmm. you, you obviously, and this one has a pump on. Mm -hmm. That pump is necessary? Uh, yes, the way that we um, uh, fight fire and force, like, and of course every uh, jurisdiction has its needs based on its uh, you know, population, geographic, topography, all that. Uh, our tenders, for instance, grass fires, uh, we use our, those tenders to, to fill up brush trucks and other trucks. When you're coming, you know, f for instance, in the fires that we had in Carlos Avery, it's a long ways from a hydrant to anywhere out there. And so being that these grass fires move, when you set up a dunk tank, your grass fire is only going to be in that area for a short period of time. So you've got to be mobile with your water system. And so uh, since uh, trucks without uh, pumps basically depend on gravity to supply. Um, you got to have them. And then in, in structural firefighting, uh, we use them to pump into uh, other engines. Now you got the two tanker tenders, right? Yep, we have the two tanker tenders. If we fix this one, would you keep this one around after it's in replacement for extra capacity? Is there that need to have a third truck out there for water, large capacity? You mean an engine uh, tender? Yeah. So if we replace, if we fix this truck, mm -hmm. and we get another five, ten years, and we got you a, a replacement for this also for main service, would you be keeping this one other than just for parts? Would mean with this something you'd use at Carlos Savory in a large event, or? Yeah, as long as the truck ran, uh, we would continue to use it. I mean, it's just it's been an amazing truck for us. You know, to get 33 years out of a truck uh, is pretty unheard of. Uh, you know, the biggest issue that it has going against it at this point is is the corrosion on the cradle and the, and the frames. Uh, there, it is 33 years old, so there isn't any guarantee on how much longer it's going to go. But at this point, the transmission and the drivetrain are in great shape. I just look at you know about a fifty thousand dollar repair just uh, discounted right away because we, we already discussed resale on this thing is going to be next to scrap. Yeah, I mean you're selling a, a truck that has a major frame uh, repair on it and even fixed though it's still value isn't very much. Yeah, you're looking at ten fifteen thousand dollars probably. Yeah, so but we, I mean if we if, if we, we were to opt into the oh, Linwood truck instead we wouldn't have the $50,000 repair, we could actually, you know, look at that money as part of what we're going to be paying for a new vehicle. Uh, that's yeah, my train of thought anyway. If we can get that to carry us through, you guys can get the vehicle that fits your needs, spec'd out the way it works with the department the best. Um, you know, it, it I think from cost a cost that much more. From a financial uh, money sense, it probably makes the most sense at this point because with, with the 85 Mac and the 85 uh, Ford, you've got no guarantee going into the future with either one of them as far as how long they're going to last. One's free, one's $46,000. Um, you know, I want to go out and take a look at it and make sure that that's going to um, operate uh, the way we need it to. And then I think I, there was a question there that I think didn't get answered. You would ask if, if maybe I misunderstood you, but if we um, kept 4127, would we have a need for that engine? Could we cut back on one of the pumper tankers? Is that the question that you had originally asked? No, it would be keeping it in addition. Okay. Not selling it, you know, for eight to $10,000. I would just really like to see the DNR truck here ASAP so we're yeah. covered. Um, but I'm really kind of, the big question is, are we going to try to get you a, a spec'd out apparatus? 
this year, you know, as soon as we can get it delivered. Uh, well, you know, you're, year, you're looking at... Um, you know, it have to be budgeted for next year? Well, if it, if it, was, <clears throat> if it was budgeted in 29, 2019 CIP, um, in order tomorrow, you're looking at... Um, at the specific time here, you're looking at 210 to 270 days, and that's just that's just a um, basically their box truck, um, nothing special, just their carbon cut what they make over and over and over again, and typically you know sell to the smaller departments that just want a truck with nothing else. I think we we were in agreement that we don't want to just get a run of the mill truck for paying a quarter million dollars. We want to get exactly what we mm -hmm. want to get. Yeah, so and what's I, the delivery time on on something if we were to go to the drawing board. And a year. You're year. you're looking at uh, eleven months. It, so the it, the DNRs. I, I know you said that it has to go back to them at the end of the year. Well, from to? from Linwood to the DNR, so it gets off Linwood's books. Um, we can take delivery of it at any time. We'd have to pay the insurance and the maintenance up to it till the first of the year. And then it's basically a paperwork shovel or shuffle to get it off of Linwood's, to get it off the books at Linwood. And then the DNR would transfer what, to us. What is the cost of that year lease, so to speak, with the DNR? Well, we may, being that it's in use right now, sidestep the five thousand dollars that they charge that's all it is though five thousand yep okay yeah no brainer. It, yeah. yeah because typically what happens is when it goes back to the dnr they do a full service on the truck and that's basically what you're paying for in the five thousand but being that this truck is already in service and it would go directly from linwood to us i can't speak for the dnr but i my anticipation is that you would sidestep that five thousand dollar charge you mentioned clearance. Is that going to pose a problem for anything? That was, you a, different truck. That was, what? That was a different truck. You said ground that, clearance? The, the clearance issue, that was not the Linwood truck? That was a different? Nope, option. that's a DNR surplus oh, truck. The, okay. the ones that they have available because okay. them are used for towing Yesterday. tanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're expensive. So, um, you know, with that being said, if it's something that, that, you know, we've got the other truck that's set up for CIP for, um, 2019, that's 550,000. Um, if we uh, order a second truck to fall in that CIP for next year, um, basically how that works is when you order your um, chassis, you don't have a payment due until that chassis is built and that's six months out. So with the pumper tender that we've got, uh, we're hoping to get that thing ordered here in the next couple of months. And so we can take delivery of it for next year's CIP money, but it, there is nothing down until actually the chassis is built, and then that's when money is due. So, uh, Dan? Yeah. Is that part of the pay as you go, or are we still going to have to bond for that truck? No, I think there's probably potentially, I'd have to take a look at the fund balance, but there probably is enough fund balance in the CIP to cover both of them, but that would probably shuffle some other things down the line for other departments. I have to take. Because I guess, you know, we kind of budgeted for the engine replacement, but not the tender replacement. So now you're adding another 250000 into that CIP budget, which would shuffle something else down the line if you didn't want to go on the bonding. However, we just put in the half million dollars from the last year's surplus, so we did kind of help kind of turbocharge that account a little bit. So there is a bigger buffer in there than there was at the beginning of the year. Don't we also still have buffer in that? Aren't we sitting at like 57% in general fund surplus that we could do a, a transfer yeah you could but i think that seven percent isn't probably i i'd have to get the numbers from hannah exactly okay. what that, but i don't think that's probably enough to cover the cost of this okay. um you know one option too as i was just kind of listening to kind of some options i just started doing some you know back in the napkin math as to what it costs to do a repair if you get five years out of it versus what if you get a new truck and say average life on a truck is 20 years i mean potentially i mean just for you on a on a on a Tender, you're getting in that 25 to 30 years 
because you just don't have all the different things that you have on an engine. So we assume, I mean, just from the I mean, just from the sake of like, what is you know, are we money out by kind of doing a repair and then doing a replacement, like say in three or four years when we're kind of the CIP is a little bit healthier. If I took the forty six dollars and say we got five more years with no other maintenance costs on, I mean, both of these don't include for any other maintenance costs on a new truck or a replacement truck. You're ballparking ninety two ninety two hundred a year for the repair over five years. If you buy the two hundred fifty thousand dollar truck and take it over twenty five years, you're at ten grand. So it's about mm -hmm. the same cost per year. It's just that if you repair this one, you potentially kind of maybe space the CAP a little bit more, and you may have at the end of the five years an additional tender that's still functional if you keep that tender in replacement for five years. I mean, it's an option. I mean, just in terms of like you're not necessarily losing. The biggest problem with that it's an old truck. There's no guarantees anywhere right. with this thing. That's exactly, that's we're, the X factor. I think we'd just be pumping good money after bad. And uh, <clears throat> there's, and when I get into it, this $46,000 might seem small. But, you know, and they really start tearing into it. So the, the notion that, that uh, we don't have reliable equipment for a city of 20,000 people does not make sense to me at all, at all. Exactly. And, and we need to be upgrading this as soon as we can. And uh, it's just going to cost us money after that. Yeah. Or, Ed? Well, I was just going to say, I don't like the fact, you know, that we're relying on mutual aid right now. I mean, say there's two fires out there, and now you got nothing, you know. And if we can get this Linwood truck to tide us over, I just think that's almost a no-brainer. Yeah, ASAP. Um, yeah, so I guess, Chief, before we plan on the Linwood truck, I think we need to have you look at it to make sure we're not going to see rust jacking on the frame or I, you know i'm sure it's a very usable truck i mean they they've used it for many years but just to make sure it is going to fit our needs short term rise would it be prudent to uh <clears throat> have eam you know they're the they're the company that we do truck maintenance with exactly. and spend five hundred dollars and have them go through it and make sure that Yes. We're not going to take delivery and spend fifteen thousand. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. How much is that truck costing us? Uh, you know, five thousand? No, it wouldn't cost us anything. Zero to five. Yeah. So even if you had to put a little bit of money in it to get you yeah. through. Yeah, I mean, but here here's the. I don't want to say it's a downside because it's going to be that with any direction you go. Um, if we take delivery of it and have a major repair on it we've got to fix that before we turn it into the DNR. Mm -hmm. If uh, we don't have any repair in it, we can walk away from it at any time. I mean, our, our cost at this point would be to insure the truck uh, through the city, which is n relatively nothing on a truck that's this old. Uh, and as far as the $5,000 cost for that, I just got to make sure there's no guarantee we wouldn't have to pay that. But in my discussion between um, the Linwood chief and myself, he thought probably not. Mm -hmm. All the more reason to pay to get it and inspect, like go through a thorough inspection, though. I'm Al, why did it? Why did they purchase a new one? I mean, the chief tell you? Um, just age. You know, they just spent eight thousand on the. Um, front and axles of the truck, you know, you, you start getting to that age, those things need to get replaced and, and they get awfully expensive when you're replacing, uh, you know, an axle for a six wheel drive DNR truck, not cheap. Yeah. So yeah, let's, let's go forward and inspect it and make sure it's-, it's Check the frame. Signal. And um, I guess, Dan, we need to look at how we're gonna pay for, um, the fire department needs, you know, make sure that we've got the budget for that. But I'll take it back and work with Alan, Hannah, just try to figure out how we can take a look at the CIP and what we can, you know, where we're at, what we can do to shuffle or what we can do to make sure that we can try to get this purchase accounted for in there. We'll bring an updated report back. Well, and, and honestly, I wouldn't mind speeding up the purchase of one of those other uh, uh, engines that you're talking about just to, you know, so it's got to be done anyway. Um, I don't want. It's not going to go away. Yeah. Is there a benefit, to, a, there a benefit to ordering multiple and? Well, you know, I, it, it it when we bought them back in '96, 
that was a time that the company that we purchased them through was going with it, going in through a major buyout, a huge transition from, you know, just a, a small national company to um, a global company, and uh, they had growing pains, and and um, they readily admit that. And so, is the potential that that could happen again? I don't know, but it's got me kind of gun shy. Um, you know, through the life of those trucks, we spent a, just a ton of money to keep them going because of issues that were, quite frankly, there from day one. And so um, a lot of fire departments do that, order multiple at the same time. I'm just gun shy because we've lived through a not very good uh, history with those two trucks. So I'm talking about two different trucks, so not the identical you know, sister trucks as you call them, right? No, these are two. You want to replace both of these? Right away? Or well, no, one of them right away. I mean, the one, one we up. just looked at needs to get replaced without a doubt. And then bump up but one that of the next engine tender or whatever. Yeah, you know, basically it, it's set up. Trying to push the other one way down the line yep. is maybe let's step this one up a year and push that one down a year or two so that they are spread out more. But mm -hmm. I just, I mean, I find it really surprising that, you know, the average age of our vehicles are over drinking age anyway and you know they shouldn't be that old well you look at them they look like they're in great shape i mean we take care of our equipment but uh uh still breaks you know, it's no it, they still old. break and and we haven't uh you know i talked to previous chiefs and they just haven't had this issue with trucks but you know when i got on the department we we're running 225 calls a year uh, this year we're going to surpass uh 500 calls so uh you know each year we just keep on going with more and more calls and so these trucks are getting used a lot more so it just uh with that being said you know we're in a conversation of you well, know looking at that replacement and history and actually gotta have reliable equipment that's all driving it down when we replace this one are we going to put this one down to you know take five years left off that replacement date well you know when you're when you're looking at a uh um pumper tanker you should be looking at 20 years max. We're at 22 years, uh, we'll be at 23 years for the pumper tender next year. And then the other one, we were looking at replacing at the 26th year. So, uh, but we had air packs, that was 238,000 that, that uh, uh, by standard, we had to replace them. And so uh, these things, you know, what gets pushed out, something has to, you know, moving forward, we can, you know, Put a CIP system that's a little bit more favorable for, uh, you know, getting these trucks replaced sooner. And and you know the departments that have it figured out, they're replacing these trucks sooner because of the re or the resale on them is better than what it is. You know these two tenders when we go to sell them with a, with crack tanks and and uh, one with frame uh, jacking on it, uh, they're going to be scrap value. You know, or somebody from uh, the private market may pay a little bit more, but no, no fire department's going to want them. No. All right. Any other questions? Do so you guys have enough to go on on there? And we'll anxiously wait to hear back from you on that. Sounds great. Ah, uh, Dan, you want to take us through the social media update? Yeah, maybe members of the council. Uh, we looked back, I might we talked with uh, Bridget, just kind of regarding our social media policy. So um, as you're well aware, the city uses Facebook. The fire department has a Facebook page. city has a Facebook page. And the police department has a Facebook page. Um, and as part of that uh, social media management, we do tend to get comments and uh, posts from residents on our Facebook page. We try to encourage that because it's one of those avenues where we are able to interact with residents who may not feel comfortable coming to a meeting. Um, however, what we've kind of seen kind of out in the marketplace right now is that there's some other municipalities who are uh, being, flag of turn, like basically sued by the ACLU for posts that have been deleted. Um, they basically claim that it's a free speech violation that if you offer a social media page and somebody posts something on there, you don't have a policy behind why you can or cannot delete a post. Um, the ACLU has kind of stepped in on some of these um, other municipalities that have deleted posts and um, said, hey, you're, you're limiting free speech here. 
So what they've ended up doing, some of these municipalities have actually kind of gone back and developed a policy that sets the guidelines for what can and what kind of posts you do allow on your page because it's um, obviously there's certain you know criteria that you can't have somebody posting explicit material on the page in a public forum. You want to be able to delete that material. Uh, so what we ended up doing, Bridget went back and kind of drafted a, a social media policy that we'd like to um, have um, implemented. So again, it just kind of sets the standards for us to allow us to delete posts. Currently on the city page, um, we don't typically delete posts. However, if one does come up that's slanderous, that is explicit, um, defamatory libels, we want to be able to have that post deleted. And if the poster asks, why did you delete that post? We can say, well, it's not in line with our policy. So we basically have some legal backing as to why we're deleting posts. Um, the policy that's included in the packet tonight is actually would go on the about section of the city's Facebook page. Um, when we actually looked at what the current text is on the about section, it basically just states welcome to the official page for the city of Forest Lake. Um, use this page to stay up to date with all the happenings in the city of Forest Lake. So again, there's no language there that basically says it's a public page. We have the right to delete comments if they fit the certain criteria. Um, we don't typically have a big issue with this. This is more of kind of an insurance policy where when we do kind of have these issues kind of arise, we have some ability to um, delete posts. I guess kind of the ask tonight is if there's any changes you want to see made as policy, we get them made. But we'd like to get this basically up on the page. If you guys are a kind of an agreement that we need a little bit more legal you know, meat behind our policy for um, post deletion, we'd like to get it on there as soon as possible just because it is kind of a, a oversight on the city side. We do need some a little bit this kind of this loop closed up and then we'd bring it forward at the next council meeting for just kind of a, a as part of the consent agenda for adoption. So we'd have, if it ever comes back, we're saying, you know, the poster says, you know, you deleted my post, what's your authority? We can say, here's the policy and here's when council actually adopted it. So it was basically, you know, council did have an ab ability to weigh in on it. Um, and again, one thing that we did add was that if we do delete a user's post, we will, we will try to reach out to that user and let them know why it was deleted, where they're not just kind of going, my post isn't there anymore. You know, and again, we're kind of on evolving, this is kind of an evolving topic right now. Like a couple of years ago in social media management, this was not even really brought up because this was kind of deemed in a different legal framework. But all of a sudden now they're kind of saying that, you know, with the ACLU kind of showing that you're limiting free speech in a public forum, you want to have a policy behind it, so... Can, can you black posts legally? That kind of falls under this. You know, I guess in the past, on a couple of them, and the, one of the things, this kind of predates when I started with the city, was that we didn't block the post. There was a ability on Facebook to basically, the post was able to be seen by the poster and the people who followed that poster, but not the general public. So that's what we did. <coughs> However, when I kind of had conversations with Bridget, Facebook keeps kind of changing their algorithms and changing how they're administering it. So it's kind of like, we don't want to put, we'll block you, but we'll be able to have you be seen. But then if Facebook changes that mechanism, we have to kind of come back and change the policy. This is kind of blanket enough where it allows us to kind of at least stay current without having to kind of constantly come forward with how Facebook kind of changes how they're administering it too. So again, this is a little bit of, you know, the legal framework behind kind of how social media is managed is kind of ever evolving. I think this is kind of the next step in the city's evolution just to make sure that we're not kind of caught out in the wood without having anything behind us in terms of a post deletion. All right. You know, there's the ability to screen, com I mean, you have to approve a comment before it's posted, but I don't know how many we get. Would that be more work for the personnel? I think well, that's what I was just thinking is um, there's plenty of social media outlets out there that, you know, until larger cities than us get something settled, why do we just not allow posting on our sites? Because this would be a daily administration. You know, if it's an hour a day, you know, you got 250 hours okay. a year plus of a city staff time. Isn't it already today a daily administration, though? You're always monitoring. Yeah, this is currently, so we're currently monitoring this right now. Basically what happens is that in the past, if we've had to delete a post or a post has gone up, I mean, I guess where this kind of comes back on the other side of it is if somebody posts a defamatory comment against somebody else and we leave it up and we don't take it down, we're potentially, it's kind of a double-edged sword where it's like the person who's posting is like, why didn't you take it down? You should take it down. Well, then it'd be you know, so it's kind of like we're in this nexus of at least just by putting this up there, we're covered in terms of if we have to take a post down. 
I mean, we do monitor it. Staff does monitor it. You know, I mean, I've done a lot of monitoring of a daily year. If somebody posts something that's, you know, completely slanderous, I mean, I, I like the ability to basically pull it down and let the resident know, hey, you were swearing in the post, it was truly vulgar, offensive, or you put a post to a, a pornographic website on the city's page, we're taking it down. Here's where it's, our policy states on it. And then if they hire an attorney to say, why did you put it down? It's like, at least you have a policy. You know, right now I'm kind of saying, you know, it's a, just kind of an administrative choice that's there. And again, you know, ordinarily, you know, considering that this has such a public impact, that's kind of why I wanted to bring it before council, just so you guys have the ability to say, are aware that we're kind of going down this path. From a day-to-day -day standpoint, the social media management will not potentially change. What this comes into play is if all of a sudden we start seeing slanders posts on there, we have the ability to pull them down and have some teeth as to why or an explanation as to why we're pulling them down. And then in kind of to take it to the next level of conversation, um, we do have a social media management policy as part of the personnel policy that was passed about four years ago. Looking at that too, that's you know just kind of how the landscape has evolved over the last four years. That one's out of date as well. However, that's a longer kind of internal process in terms of how we're to manage that. So we kind of looked at this is more the triage, got to get something in place. The internal social media management policy is kind of a longer term, but that's probably something that we need to look at as well, just to make sure that we're current with kind of trends. Is again, this thing is evolving. You know, you know what Facebook in five years could look completely different than it is now, but we at least need to have, you know, some legal protection to, as to, you know, managing posts. Um, I, as I read through, um, th this all makes sense. The only, the only one that I give a little bit of pause to is comments and support or opposition to political candidates, political parties, ballots. I understand from like a general election standpoint, but at some point we also are all political candidates. And so I, what I wouldn't want to, would be to create an environment that if someone were to say, Mara Bain is terrible and should never serve office, that should be an okay thing to say because that's me serving in my role as long as it meets the other criteria. Um, I, I think that's part of what we sign up for, um, so I would be hesitant to eliminate that. Um, but and it's... I, I take the other side. I don't think that belongs on our city page or our city post. You could. If they want to post that on their personal page or your personal page, right. Right. fine. That's I think that lays down to also like... Also to management, right? So if you think about... Yeah, it's it, looks like the, it looks like the city's weighing in and they right. shouldn't be weighing right. in. I think that's the intent is, is like, uh, at its commenting too, where it's more along the lines of you're saying support candidate X and it's, they're using it as another way to form, you know, to use our basically our yep. big... Because there is some value in the fact that the city has a baked and fall audience. Going. Yep. And the same thing with like the police and the fire page. All of a sudden, if that kind of happens... You want to reserve the right. I mean, typically, if somebody wants to make a comment in support or opposition of a decision, we typically leave those on. It's just part of the recourse or conversation that happens. It's just when if all of a sudden you're getting spammed with 200 posts in support of ballot measure acts, you want to reserve the right to say, okay, we're pulling them down, and here's why. So it's intended of this isn't your campaign platform, and it shouldn't be a campaign Correct. platform. Yep. And I'm fine with that. Correct. Agree. I'm kind of the mind of, you know, the police have their own page. If they want to post and endorse candidates, yeah. fine, that's their business. Or if they don't, no. But I don't think it should be on the city page. And I, and I think well, the, this I would, think anything that's related to the city should come under the same guidelines. Yep. I don't think, you Good know, um, each department should have its own guidelines. No, but you could have, and I don't, I don't follow them anyway, but as long as they're not using, I guess, any of the city logos or anything like that, and they're posting. I don't well, but they are posting. You know, the ones that are official, Force Lake Police, Force Lake Fire. City oh, Force but you Lake. could have support our police or whatever. And if they oh, want to, yeah, if they want to post, that's, that's fine. Page, mm -hmm. right? The private yeah. moderator, not. Yeah. Al's not nominating me for mayor or anything like that. So. He will if you get him his truck. There <laughs> 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 we go. We'll see how you look. Yeah, this, these are only applied to city managed page. The, the official page, you know, like the official police department page, the official fire department page. Any page that's managed as somebody on the side, this would not apply to, or the, the official city. Anything that's a, recognized as a city communication tool, this would apply to. I think it's good stuff. needs tweaking. We can worry about it then. So uh, I, one more thing, I guess, um, you know, is giving, say, the city administrator 
authority to just shut the page down. Um, you know, if you're getting spammed, if you're doing whatever, just, you know, be, they have the ability to just unplug it for, till, till a, res a resolution can get resolved on or it anyway. Turn off, hide all comments, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, and I think we currently do kind of have that. I mean, I, I've, I've always kind of rent managed the fact that if we start getting tons of spam, you know, we will turn comments off. However, if you look kind of how social media is supposed to function as a way for, as a feedback opportunity, we do get a lot of valuable feedback from some of the comments that come in. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, you, you usually have a little bit of discretion in terms of where you want to take it. This, again, just kind of gives, you know, in those situations where it starts to go down the path where it's not, we're not getting the good comments anymore, the, the appropriate comments, we at least have the ability to kind of get those removed <coughs> off the page. Do we have multiple people running the Facebook page? Uh, right now on the city side, um, I'm the main administrator on it, and we have um, Jamie is also on the page, and I also say Liz has access who's temporary. I used to manage it all, you know, it was all just primarily myself and Aaron beforehand, and then, you know, I've, I still, I'm still in there just not as much, just kind of given the new, you know, set of responsibilities. It's, it's still on my work plan, but it's not as, I'm not in there as much as I used to be kind of making sure it's all you know, moving, but I, I do check in multiple times a week on it. Does Facebook allow official pages to have multiple administrators? So not that we terminated an employee and they could have the passwords and yeah, so I have everybody set up. So like I have full admin rights and then everybody else's level is a little bit different. They can post, but they can't remove. There's like, there's certain levels of security that they're allowed to, so they can't go in there and just basically delete anything off the page. I think they have rights to, I think they're set up that they can edit and post, but they can't delete or, I have to take back a look, but yeah, you can set very admin rights in terms of who has access to what. Um, in one last comment, um, the business solicitation portion of that, uh, commercial solicitations, if I can speak, promotions or spam. Um, you know, I think, you know, maybe it's being on the EDA or whatever, but um, I think it might be beneficial for the city to be able to say, hey, grand opening in business X or anniversary this, that. Um, so I guess I would look to, you know, either strike that or, or you know, allow the city to, uh, city staff to post that, but not individuals or something. Yeah, and I think that I think that's a, we we have in the past, and if a business opens up, we'll say congratulations to business X for your opening or moving to Forest Lake. I think this would be more along the lines of if you know we, we'll get hit up every now and again on the, you know from different vendors that want to put a there's unique product on our page because again they can hit three thousand four thousand people putting a link on there. One or two, I'd usually let them slide. You know, if it's a local business, you know, it's like and they're, if it's related to the post, if they're sponsoring the event, you know, that's a little bit different than if it's a out of state organization that's just looking for some free, you know, metrics on their, on their uh, Facebook analytics. So yeah, I mean, this is more for the out of state stuff, but local stuff we still maintain. We'll still be able to do that. Okay. Any other comments? All right. So I guess based on that, I'll get this cut and paste. I'll put it on the about section tomorrow. So we'll kind of get this in place and we'll do the formal adoption as part of the consent agenda on Monday. So if there's any Thing that changes, we can get those. You know, you have a, you have the final changes before on Monday's um, council meeting, just so we can get it kind of formally adopted and go from there on that. All right. We'll move on to the school bus lane. Uh, Maybe members of council, uh, I had reached out to Bridget just to kind of get an update on the uh, kind of the status of the school bus lane that was constructed as part of the Highway 97 61 roundabout project. Uh, she did provide a memo of just a kind of a high level 30,000 foot summary of how we kind of got to where we are with the school bus lane. I just got to cut myself in so I can show you exactly what we're talking about here. No, it's out. So the area that we're actually talking about here is, um, I'm gonna get orientated here. Oh, that's the wrong map, doesn't have listed. Is this lane right here, which is the roundabout here at 97. There's a school bus lane that kind of comes up 
and turns and it goes back. The school bus, the, the school uses it as a bus lane when they, for drop offs in the morning. And I believe they also use it, do they stage out here in the afternoon, Ryan, as well? I, I know for sure in the morning it's. In the parking lot they do, yeah. So primarily there's a sign here that basically says school bus traffic only, I think from seven to nine. Um, it's the primary entrance you get up into the school's parking lot here. Um, as the Highway 97 61 project kind of evolved, um, the kind of original intent of what the original discussions were was this would be constructed as part of the project and at the end of the project, the road would be turned over to the school. You know, that was kind of the discussions that were had. Um, and, and Bridget kind of summarizes that just in a little bit more legalese than, you know, I just said. But basically the school and, was, and the city and MnDOT all kind of got in the room together and formally said, MnDOT will construct it, will convey it to the city, and the city will then turn it over to the school district. Um, kind of as it kind of got down to the point, lawyers got back in and involved on that, they kind of looked at the school can't be a road authority. So the conveyance from the city back to the school, there's a little bit of an issue there. So it kind of shifted to, you know, the city basically at that point, you know, and this again, I wasn't part of this conversation, I'm just kind of summarizing, you know, where we are with it. The, the city basically said, okay, if we're not gonna turn it over to the school, can we at least enter in a maintenance agreement with the school where the city then agrees to maintain that portion of the, of the road, you know, so as they would enter that, that maintenance of this section of road then would become part of their pavement management for their schools when they do the parking lots, when they seal coat. They'd be responsible for the pollen, they'd be responsible for the seal coating and basically the pavement management of that. Which it, again still kind of meets the intent of what the original agreement was basically when the city constructed it, we basically said, yeah, we can put this in. We just didn't want to all of a sudden have to pick up another section of road, you know, for maintenance. So where I kind of sat was Bridget reached out to the school's attorney and kind of said, you know, hey, you, here's a maintenance agreement. We haven't really heard back conversation. It's kind of just kind of gotten, you know, radio silent here for a while. So we're just kind of looking at, you know, do we want to kind of re-engage the school district with the, you know, maintenance agreement on that to kind of see if we can't get some movement on that to get them to re-enter into a maintenance agreement? Because technically right now the city still has, you know, we still manage this, we still own this, everything on this is still, you know, cities. We're just trying to look at from the maintenance perspective of turning the maintenance over to the school district. Because again, that was the original intent. And Ryan, you were involved in, I mean, make, if I'm misspeaking any of these points, you know, feel free to, you know, correct me. But I'm just trying to provide a summary of, of that. But again, the intent on this point would be to get the school district to kind of, would be to have them perform the maintenance of this, of this section of roadway. Because again, if you look at it, when you drive through, I mean, it does look like a school driveway. I mean, it's signed as such. It looks like, uh, you know, basically a part of the school campus at this point. Um, one thing that kind of has complicated the conveyance a little bit too is that there is some underlying property owners there that are not the school district. <coughs> so that's part of the conversation too. I don't know exactly where that fits in there, but I knew that that's part of it as well. Well, and um, I was on the council uh, when this project first came forward and um, that was always the discussion was the school was going to assume that road. Uh, there was definitely a lot of conversation regarding that because the city you know, didn't want to have the maintenance responsibilities for the road. The school district was going to take that road over. That, that was the whole agreement before we agreed to the whole project with MnDOT. Uh, the city spent, I think, well over two million on the project, including the bridge that goes over. So, I mean, we weren't uh, <coughs> just bystanders on this project. Uh, I, it's really disappointing that the school is trying to um, get out of this agreement right at the moment. Um, I had a conversation with Dr. Massey on Friday to talk about this a little bit as well, and. I don't, you know, I, I guess I told them that to me it doesn't matter if it's ownership by the city or the school district, it's the responsibility for the maintenance and getting that agreement. If, if the city ultimately ends up with ownership of that road, it's fine, but it's, it's a private road and I just feel the school district really needs to live up to their prior agreement and, and take that over. 
I believe they're plowing it now. Yeah, that was I was going to say. I do believe that they already, and some of the maintenance already are performing some of the maintenance of that road by just doing the, the plowing of it. I think they were looking at probably some of the pavement management perspective of it is kind of getting that included. And it's a significant cost when that, you know, seal coating or, or redoing it. It's, it's going to be a lot of money. But this, from square one, it, it was never a discussion point whether the school was going to take that over or not. That was their private road. Was there, was there discussion of vacation, of just, uh, what, was the, what was the rationale that that maintains, uh, is co continuing to be a street and not part of school property? Was, there, was that part of the conversation? State right away. I think Ryan can, he was involved in even earlier discussions, but um, it was due to closing, because the proximity to the roundabout and the entrance to Highway 97 and the school in front, closing that is where this evolved into getting used for the school entrance. So, so the school bus lane that's today is the old northbound Trunk Highway 61. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. MnDOT and the school districts worked very closely together on how this would, you know, improve traffic flow with the school and all that to the point that, you know, the road was. Uh, milled and overlaid the portion, but the very north end where you got to curl in, that's all new reconstruction that was coordinated with the school district, you know, with the understanding this is going to become school property. Buses will come this way. Uh, even storm sewer improvements had to occur up that north. So it wasn't like this is something new, you know. It was very surprising to the city staff to find the, uh, I guess, the position the school took. The only thing I can comment on, I guess, is that, you know, when we were going through all these project management team meetings for two years, MnDOT was meeting with the city, you know, at MnDOT, here at City Hall, with school representatives at the school district, public meetings, you know, it was always talked about this uh, becoming school roadway uh, and a future, you know, staging area for other buses. Well, and I, I was very vocal about this not in a... Uh, so what I'm looking for is an advantage of becoming a city road because it's a dead end. Mm -hmm. I can't designate it as a state aid road because it doesn't tie into anything to the north. It has to tie into a county or state road or another state aid mm -hmm. designated road. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, those are all conversations that yeah. would do us no good. Right. It's just a long stretch of road. We would be re held responsible for maintenance and all that. So with former, you know, school staff, you know, we've, the conversation evolved and, you know, once the project got to the completion, that's when MnDOT could convey it to the city, then the city would convey it to the MnDOT, or to the school district. But now, here we're, here we're at. They're playing dirty pool. They're playing dirty pool. I, I hate the configuration right now, you know. I would lo love for it not to be connected to the north because I have my own safety issues when people are turning in that, that whole conflict point right there that's been created. But. Well, I, th I think the original thought was that they had to close the main entrance, otherwise buses would have stacked up into the roundabout. And yep, because their main entrance, you could probably pull up an old aerial. Could you pull up Google Earth and go back? Oh, here's one as, as it was getting constructed. Is that's not you, you can see where the entr entrance was right here, right there. Yeah. So that went away. Mm -hmm. That's where all the buses came in off of 97 and entered their school parking lot and then exited out to Goodview. Thus, then you were going to have this very long school bus lane for all your stacking and how it's going to improve your efficiency and safety on your campus to be to where we're at today. Right. Other than the school not able not able to be a road authority, other reasons why? I mean, anything more specific provided? Cost. Well, they don't want to uh, have the deferred there, maintenance, or maintenance it, in the future. Was there acknowledgement that that was different than the original conversation? No, you know, I mean, I, we just became aware of this a year ago. I mean, it was always given the fact that that was gonna be a school road. I mean, even the way it, the signage is up there, like to point it out to begin with, that's a driveway, it's not a road. Uh, MnDOT constructed it, you know, or they used, mainly they used the old Highway 61 roadbed, but it was still fresh asphalt, everything else. So, I mean, we're not gonna have maintenance for quite a while, but 
um, yeah, it, it's a matter of the school living up to their commitments. I mean, I guess technically as it sits right now, I mean, it is a public road. I mean, it, it is, you know, it's a city street, you know, that I, I think at the end, you know, the maintenance agreement was kind of the, the, the land between <coughs> making them, turning it completely over to them and, you know, sitting as like, basically it still accomplishes the goal where it's, you know, I stated earlier was that, you know, we don't care if we have to own the road. We just, the maintenance cost is kind of what we're looking at at this point. And a maintenance agreement would allow them then to, you know, incorporate that into the rest of their payment management for their parking lots and for everything else and kind of get that when they bid out their work, put it on their maintenance schedules there. We basically say, okay, we're fine with your maintenance schedules. You can maintain it how you, you know, want to maintain it. It's just, again, at this point, this would be, you know, if there's a major repair that needs to be done out there, you know, it's a city, city cost. But the wear and tear on the road is due to their school buses, right? There's, it's not being used for cars. I mean, there are cars that go down there. I mean, when, mm -hmm. I, when I access the school, I have to go there. I mean, I, I go down there. There is some traffic but that goes main, down there. But the main primary purpose is for the school buses. Correct. The only school traffic is going to be using it. No one's going there to get home. No, and... and, and for school safety, only school traffic should be using it anyway. And it is signed here. If you, there's a couple of signs there. I don't exactly remember... The wording on the sign, but does state something like school. It's it's pretty clearly marked. If I was coming in and not knowing that, I would look at that as that's the driveway for the school, you know, not a city street. That's on current signage. Yeah, I think one of them says buses only for yeah, I think next time, next yeah. time. And Which I understand. If you're trying to stack buses, then you don't want to have a car in the middle of that. You got to have that, you know, that buses on oh, buses only. So um, we're waiting for a response from. I mean, I, I guess at this point, I mean, I can, I can talk to Bridget to kind of say, you know, shuffle this to the top of the deck, you know, if you want to kind of re-engage in that to kind of see where we are with it. I mean, I guess that's kind of was the intent here was, because this thing has been kind of just, it's been on the work plan, but it's been kind of just a quiet issue. It hasn't really raised up and, you know, there's some... So it is our road at the current time? What's that? Currently, it is still our, our road. Correct. So if we were to pull maintenance on it, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate, shut the road down for maintenance. Now what? Well, I mean... Well, you wouldn't be able to get a bus at all in there at all, if that was the case. And whose problem would that be? Well, <laughs> be ours. You can make it I don't think so. Because <laughs> we, we, we closed off the access here. I guess, theoretically, it's possible. You know, I mean, yeah. I guess reality-wise, you'd be, I mean, you'd have to pretty significant, you know, especially with school starting back up, there'd be some pretty significant traffic issues on Goodview, which would then, you know, if they had to realign their whole bus stacking, you know, as a result of that, but theoretically, as a city street, you know. that. But at this time, it's not going to cost the school anything. Uh, they've got a good road. It's a brand new road, basically. Um, that only they use. They just have to plan ahead for maintenance on it. Yeah, it's future cost. I mean, well, I mean, they are incurring the plowing cost. I, mean, I don't want to make it sound like they're not doing any maintenance out there. They are, well, yeah, yeah, they are doing the current maintenance on there in terms of when it snows, we, Public Works does not plow that out. They go out there with their plow trucks and plow it out. But it's not like it's going to cost them hundreds of thousands to get the road into usable condition. It's, it's a very heavy-duty good road. It used to be the Highway 61 for the most part. So, um, but yeah, just getting them to assume or agree to what they agreed to before. I mean, to, you know, to step up and do what's right. I mean, I can have Bridget take a look at it. I know, I, I believe from what I saw, there was a maintenance agreement that had been sent over for comment to their side. I can kind of re-engage to see where we are with that, take a look at what the maintenance agreement envisions, um, and then kind of, you know, kind of direct her, you know, maybe re-engage with the, the school's attorney and see, you know, where they're at with this. Because again, this was just kind of a summary of, you know, where we are to date on this so, issue. I would suggest to re-engage MnDOT as well as they uh, stand on our side on this. Yeah. So I would, I, mean, I would say generally it's our job to provide streets. Um, however, in this case, it sounds like, you know, with absence of this agreement, we may have approved a, we would have done a different configuration or done something different. And so that's what makes this one tough. Um, so I, Agree that MnDOT might be the neutral third party here and might be worth re-engaging. And I think if you look back at the original 
like when I did kind of research from step one, these that was kind of the envision on the original sketches. It was like school, turn back. You know, I mean that was kind of what was from day one when I saw this, the plans. And if I was when I was trying to re re recreate the facts set, that was not something that kind of got pushed in at the end. That was from the end. No, actually, MnDOT worked with the school district before they brought the plan to the city. You know, that was the key is getting their traffic flow to get everything to work right. Seems if you want to. Uh, when it was the old 61, who, was that a county highway? Who's, no, whose whose road was it? MnDOT. Okay. State. Actually, it's still MnDOT, so. Yep. Oh. So it's still MnDOT, but it's not access, not available. Well, the, the new road is MnDOT's right. through the roundabouts. Right. The one, yes. they conveyed that to us. Yeah. Yep. When did we take yep. ownership of that? From what was relayed to me, we had to be the mediator. Mediator, mm -hmm. MnDOT could not give it directly to the, to the school because the school, school is not a road authority. We are. And that we may have to keep it because we are a road authority, mm -hmm. but we have to get that agreement mm -hmm. that they're willing to assume the maintenance responsibilities on it. So do, you, do you need... Um I don't know if this is even a good option, but do you need all parties, if we're going to vacate a piece of land, do you need all parties to agree to a vacation or could we just vacate it? And I'd have to here. defer that comment to Bridget, you know, for that portion of it. And I think part of the reason why the city got involved with it too is that, you know, the agreements originally were from the city and MnDOT school was not signing on that. So you don't want to necessarily sign the city, the school district up to an agreement that had no chance to. Well, if, yep. we, if we vacate it, it doesn't go to the city. Cool, anyway. It goes to the owners then, right? There is an underlying property owner involved, so it would end up being in private owners' hands and mess. it costs the school a lot more. Yep. Similar qu question, can we assess them for it, maintenance costs? <sighs> Again, I'd have to... They're a tax exempt. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll keep this on the radar, I guess, and just you know, see how soon we get a response from the school. I'll, I'll re-engage with Bridget tomorrow and just kind of get her, you know, get this on her work plan, you know. And, and again, I think part of it is just kind of re-establishing the facts of kind of how we got to where we are. I mean, this was the 30,000-foot view. Once you get down to 20, 10, and 5, a whole bunch of different facts kind of come forward, but this is kind of the, the scope of where we are. As soon as I can, I'll stop in and talk to Dr. Massey, too. Mm -hmm. I get time. It's been almost a whole year since we last approached them here. I would like to see something move forward. We'll get a push forward. Ed. Well, the only comment I'd like to make, it's disappointing that uh, we spent a million bucks on that, the bridge. We have to maintain the bridge. You know, and now we're going to spend another million on a tunnel. Granted, it's going to hopefully be a grant, but we'll still have to maintain pass. the tunnel. An underpass. Mm -hmm. and an underpass. Yeah, and an underpass. Sorry. A nicer what do you want to call the tube? An underpass. <laughs> an underpass. The tube. Underpass is better. But in, in both instances, you know, we're doing the maintenance for the benefit of the school. So, I mean, if they can't step up and maintain the road that they want to run their buses on, you know, it's just hard dis to want very to disappointing. It's hard to want to do another partnership type exactly. program. If this exactly. Is Especially when they reached out, Massey was just here reaching out to try and establish a rapport with the city. Well, this is no way to establish a rapport. No. I simply want to go and try to get a mindset on the whole thing. That's my, my, my and agenda. Right. Yep. And, um, you know, to stand up for Dr. Massey, I mean, he wasn't involved in this to begin with. Um, and my conversations are, you know, good, open with him, but it seems like it's coming from their financial, their legal people. And <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah, and again, I'm not sure where they sit with it. This is just kind of our perspective on it. You know, I mean, again, that main industry may never have reached over there. I don't, you know, I, I'm looking through kind of old email archives and looking at where it is. I don't have confirmation that they've, seen it, responded to it, you know, and again, this could literally just be sitting on somebody's desk. I guess it's just kind of, if you want to get this pushed forward, then we can start getting those questions answered. Yeah, it's been a year, let's try again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get the timeline nailed down, who was involved when, and sometimes a review of refresh of the facts and who was at the table makes everyone, yeah. improves memory. 
Yeah, and some of it too, the, the, the problem with the, these archives lists and involve four different spaces, so trying to go through it is, you know, can be challenging at times, although I, I have a, a somewhat <coughs> of a decent idea, and, and Bridget too wasn't the lead on at the time, I think, I think Jay was working on that as well, so I mean, some of these files are getting a little bit dusty, but we'll get them dusted off and we'll get to the next point. Um, like Ryan said, I think, uh, you know, the, the MnDOT, um, the two people that were mainly involved, I can't remember the name. Adam names. Joseph Seaman, Dimitri Tabasha. Yeah, Dimitri and Adam, yep. They'd be able to clarify a lot of vague areas if there is any, but it's pretty straightforward. You know, step up and do what you committed to anyway, so. All right. Inevitably, in the long run, we don't have to do anything with it after it falls apart unless they sign an agreement. So mm -hmm. they're going to pay for it. But, but that's to neither one's benefit. Huh? That would be not to either one's benefit, the city or the... It sure wouldn't, but... All right. Anything else to bring up for the council tonight? Hearing right, none, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.